I've put together a collection of my best iOS developer interview question videos. Here's a list of what we'll cover, and they are timestamped in case you want to jump around. Now, of course, I can't cover every topic you could possibly get asked about in an interview, but these are very common topics that are asked about all the time. All right, let's get started. The vast majority of iOS apps have some sort of networking component to them. Data lives on a server, and the iOS app needs to go to that server, download the data, and display that data nicely to the user on the device. Today's video breaks down the basics of how that works. We talk about what is JSON and how to use it, and then we write a network call in code using async await and Swift. And this process is a foundational skill for any iOS developer, and will almost certainly be asked about during an iOS developer interview. Before we dive in, I wanna say that learning network calls is very tricky. It took me a long time to fully grasp them, and it took me writing a ton of different network calls to fully understand them. This video is meant for the beginner to give you the foundational skills on a simple example, but I want to encourage you that, hey, you're not gonna be a network call pro after this video or any singular video on the internet. It is going to take you time and repetition to learn this. So I wanna let you know that before we dive in, this is meant to be one of your first steps on this journey of learning network calls. Okay, so we need to download data from a server and make it look pretty on the device. When working with data from a REST API, that data will be formatted in what's called JSON, short for JavaScript Object Notation. Here's a basic example of a user object in JSON. You can see it's encapsulated by curly braces, it has key value pairs. In this example, we have a username, a bio, and an avatar URL. That's a super simple example. Let's look at a real life version of this in the GitHub API documentation. So I'm in the get a user section of the GitHub documentation. Over on the left here, you can see all the different areas you can go into. So I see I'm in user, uh, get a user is what I wanna be in. Now, so this is documentation, it'll tell you what's in the API. Over here on the right, you see this default response. Now, because I have my screen blown up, it's a super little window, but you can see, right? Here's this curly braces, there's a login, there's an avatar URL. Uh, down here, you'll see a bio. Now, this is just an example of you know, the response. What I like to do is take this URL here in the curl, copy it, and then if you open up your terminal, you can type in curl and then paste that URL. Now you see it's api.github.com users and then username, this is like the placeholder. So let's delete username and I'll type in my username, S-A-L-L-E-N 0400. You can type in your GitHub username, hit return, and this returns real data from the API. So you can see here's my login, you see here's my bio, iOS developer specializing in Swift. You can see, you know, follower count. So this is what a real example of JSON would look like. And again, you can see it's encapsulated by the curly braces. You can see the key value pairs, right? The key is login, the value is SAllen0400. And this is an example where I just get one object back. It's very common that you're gonna need a list of objects. So I'm gonna, down here in the next prompt here, curl, same thing, except now I'm gonna do slash followers. And I know this from the API, I just wanna show you. If I hit return, this is gonna be a list of my followers now. So I wanna show you this, we'll scroll back up to the top. Here's where I typed it. Now, the reason I wanna point this out is because this is another common example of JSON. You see this bracket here? It probably looks familiar from an array. So here we get back an array of my followers, right? There's the, the login, the avatar URL, and then you see it's separated by comma. Here's another follower, here's another follower. So I wanna point this out because yes, the JSON could return a single object, or could return a list of objects. I mean, it can do a lot more, but these are two very common examples that I wanna introduce you to for working with JSON. And a quick note about the GitHub API. This is an example of an open API. Some APIs require you know, authentication, where you have to have a, a login and a username. Some APIs require an API key. Because this video is meant for the absolute beginner, right? writing your very first network call, learning this tough subject, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Just know that network calls are a very deep subject. We're just scratching the surface and dealing with API keys and OAuth, that's an adventure for another time. We're sticking with the absolute basics. Okay, so now you know the data is formatted in JSON. You've seen real examples of it. So let's get back to the task at hand. And that is we need to download this JSON, somehow convert this JSON into models in our Swift code base, and then use those Swift models to build our UI to show the final result to the user. When I'm building this, I like to break this down into steps. Step one is to build out the UI with dummy data, and this helps me visualize you know, what I'm working with. Step two is to look at the JSON response that you see here and use it to create the models in our Swift code base. 
And then step three is to actually write out the networking code. And then step four is to use that networking code and connect the UI with the final result. Okay, step one, build out the UI with dummy data. Here I am in Xcode. I already have this built out, but as you can see, super basic Swift UI code. Wanted to save some time here. And this step goes hand in hand with designing the feature. Of course, if you're designing your own app, right? If you're working for a company, they have their own server, they have a designer giving you a spec, that's different. You build what they give you. But if you're designing your own app, this is the step where I look at the JSON and I see, okay, this is the data I have to work with, right? I have an avatar URL, I have a bio, I have the, the Twitter URL. I can only build my GitHub profile screen to include what data I get back, right? And this is what happens when you're working with someone else's API, whether it's GitHub, YouTube, Twitter, you're limited by what they give you. So that's why in this step, look at the JSON, build out your feature. And again, I like to build out my dummy UI to visualize what I'm working with. And in our simple GitHub profile user page, we're just gonna have the profile picture, their username, and their bio. Now that we have the basic UI sorted, I move on to step two, and that is creating the models that I'm going to use from the JSON. So here in Xcode, let's do that. I'm gonna create all this in one file, by the way. I'll talk about that in a second. But let's create a struct called GitHub user. So this is the object for the user that we're gonna use. Now, what properties do we need? Again, looking at the UI, uh, we're gonna need the profile picture, the username, and the bio. Now, pulling up the JSON, you can see the username is called login. I have the avatar URL and I have the bio. So that's what I wanna work with. Now, back in the day, us Swift developers used to have to parse the JSON manually and it was a major pain. I'm not even gonna get into that. Nowadays, we have a nice protocol called Codable. So I'm gonna make GitHub user conform to Codable. You can see here. And real quick, actually, you can see the documentation right there. Codable. Down here it says Codable is decodable and encodable. This just combines both of them, but the use cases when you're decoding something, that is when you're downloading the data from the server. You have to decode that JSON into your models. Encodable is when you're uploading something. Say you're creating a tweet. We have to encode that tweet on the app into JSON and send it up to the server. So we're just gonna do codable. Technically, since we're just pulling, we could just do decodable, but we're gonna keep it as codable uh, for both of them. Now, when working with Codable, your property names need to match the JSON exactly. Now, there's a more advanced caveat. You know, if you want your property names to say whatever you want, you can use coding keys. That's out of the scope of this beginner course. You know, if you just make your property names exactly match your JSON, that is what you're going to do 90% of the time. So we'll say let login, and that is of type string. And then going back, our avatar URL, you can see is let avatar underscore URL. And then bio is just bio. So let bio of string. Now I'm going to contradict myself a little bit because here's our GitHub user and we are matching our JSON exactly. So this will work. But in Swift, right? Look at our avatar URL. That's snake case. We don't typically write our property names using snake case. That's not how we do things in Swift, right? We use camel case. So instead of avatar underscore URL, we're going to do avatar capital URL. And when we write our network call, we can create our decoder and there's a property called convert from snake case on our decoder that we're gonna use. That's just a sneak preview. We'll come back to that. So that's one potential gotcha when you're matching your JSON exactly. And again, this is just because that's Swift convention to use camel case. Now we have our model object ready to go. Okay, so let's write this network call and I'm gonna do this right on our view here in our, our Swift UI view. And this is purely for educational reasons and your understandings. I remember when I was learning, it was very helpful for me to see everything all in one place. Right now in a real project, you know, you'd refactor your network calls into a view model or an API service, network manager, your GitHub user object would be in another file. But again, when I was learning, having everything in all those different places, it was difficult for me to make the connections in my head to know what was what. So to be clear, I am spelling everything out on this screen to keep everything in one place. So hopefully you can make those connections. You know, this video is not about refactoring and project organization, but just know in a real project, you would organize it and refactor it. But again, keeping everything in one place for the ease of your understanding. Okay, so the function here uh, on the view, we're gonna say func get user, and we're gonna mark that async because we are using async wait. And we're gonna mark it throws because we want to throw errors. Now, you don't have to mark this throws, but when working with network calls, there's so many things that can go wrong, right? They may not be connected to the internet. Uh, maybe, you know, you have the wrong URL or the server is down, right? So many things can go wrong with a network call. So you pretty much always are gonna have a throws here. And we wanna return a GitHub user. That's the object after we make our network call that we're gonna return from this function. 
So open curly brace, close curly brace. Now the first thing we need is the URL that we're gonna point to to get the data from. And if we go back to the GitHub API here, right? Get a user, that's what we're working with. And then here you can see the URL, this api.github.com slash users username. So I'm gonna copy this back to Xcode. We're going to say let endpoint equal, and it's gonna be a string, paste this here. Now we don't want this dummy username, right? You can put in your name, I'm gonna put in my name or put in whatever name you want of a GitHub user. Now in a real app, maybe the user you know, can type this in and then you search based on that. But again, we're just hard coding to demonstrate how the network call works. So now that I have my endpoint, we're gonna use what's called URL session, which in Swift is basically how you make network calls. Let me type out the code and then I'll explain it. So I'm gonna say let data comma response equal try await. And again, this is uh, Swift concurrency, async await, URL session dot shared dot data from URL. This is an example of a get request. So there's four main types of requests you can make with network calls. There's the get, which means you are just pulling down data, read only. There's post, which means you are posting data to the server, you're sending things up to the server, right? Get would be downloading, post would be uploading, right? If you created a tweet and uploaded it to Twitter. And then there's the put, which means you're editing something. And then there's delete, which obviously you would be deleting something. Those are the four main basic types of uh, requests. Again, we're doing a get because we're just downloading and pulling the data. So from URL, we can see I need a URL object. And if I go back to uh, just typing the data so we can see that quick little documentation, data from, you can see I get back data and a URL response. So that's why here I say, here's data and response. So what the data is, it's gonna be the data, you know, the JSON. The response is response codes. We'll get back to that in a second. So data from URL. So now I need a URL object. This looks like a URL, but this is a string. So in Swift, we have a URL object that we need to convert this string to. And when we initialize URL object, it returns an optional. So we need to do some unwrapping here. Guard let URL equal, here's our URL string, right? We're initializing a URL from a string. The string we're gonna pass in is that endpoint that we just had up here. So we're gonna pass in this string to our URL initializer, and it's gonna return a URL object, which we're gonna use in our URL session. But it can return an optional, so all I'm doing here is handling the error. We'll say throw error. We'll come back to that in one second. I just wanna finish this placeholder. So the URL that we're gonna pass in is the URL that we just created right here on line 32. Let's talk about these errors real quick, right? We're throwing, this error isn't going to work. We can create our custom error objects to handle each error specifically. And this is a common practice with network calls. So again, I'm just doing this all in one file. Maybe you'd have a separate error file, but we'll say enum gh for GitHub error. I'm just putting the gh in front of it to name it something. You can name it whatever you want. It just can't be normal error because that already exists in Swift. And uh, our custom error needs to conform to the error protocol. So I can say case, we'll say this is invalid URL. So if the URL fails, I'm going to throw the error called gh error.invalid URL. I'm going to put this on a new line for structural purposes. So again, we're creating a URL. If that URL can't be created, we throw the error invalid URL. And then if we have a good URL, we're gonna call URL session share.data from that URL, and that is going to return data in a response. So now we need to work with the data in the response. So first we wanna check the response because what the response is, if you're familiar, right, 404 not found, uh, you know, 500 server error, or 200, everything went great. These are all the HTTP response codes on the internet, and this is your opportunity to handle those accordingly. So let's do that. We'll say guard let response equal response as, and I'm gonna cast this as an HTTP URL response so I can get the codes here, and then get the response dot status code. Again, this is that 404 not found or 500 server error. So I wanna just make sure it equals 200. 200 means everything is A-OK, -okay, we're good to go. Else, and I want to throw, but I don't have the error yet. So again, down here in GH error, I'll say case invalid response, and then I will throw GH error.invalid response. Now, again, this is the opportunity. Uh, I'm only checking for 200. If we have 200, great, we're good to go. If not, throw a generic invalid response error. This would be your opportunity if you did get a 404 not found or 500 to show very specific errors to that code, again, for your app. And when dealing with network calls, it's very important to be specific about your errors, right? Have you ever used an app and it just says, unable to complete the task, and you have no idea what's wrong? This is your chance to tell the user exactly what is wrong, which is what you wanna do. 
And for the sake of time, I'm just giving you a couple of examples to point you in the right direction. So now that we have a good 200 status code, that means everything was A-OK. -okay. Now we want to work with our data to convert the JSON into our GitHub user object. So to do that, we want to do a do. We want to create our decoder. So let decoder equal JSON decoder, right? This is how we're going to decode this JSON. And then this is what I talked about earlier. We want decoder dot key decoding strategy equals dot convert from snake case. So pulling up the JSON, remember our avatar URL had that underscore space URL. Well, again, in Swift, we use camel case, not snake case. So luckily Swift has a built-in, it'll convert it for you. So that's why if I go back to my user, I can have avatar URL in camel case because what convert from snake case does, it deletes the underscore and capitalizes the first letter. That's what convert from snake case does. So again, this is the gotcha where you may not want to match the JSON exactly. Now you could match the JSON exactly and keep it snake case, have the underscore, your Swift code will just look weird. And other Swift developers will be like, what's this snake case stuff here? So that's why we want to use convert from snake case. But again, if it's one word or it's already in camel case, you want your property names in your object to match the JSON exactly. Again, with the exception of, you know, converting from snake case. Okay, finally, let's uh, return try decoder dot decode. And then we want to pass in a type and then from data. So when we're decoding, we have to tell it what type we're decoding into. So we're going to say GitHub user dot self that declares the type from the data. Well, that's the data we got back here from our URL session up here on line 36. So we're going to type in data and then a do try, you know, requires a catch. This is error handling. And then if this fails, we will throw again, we need another error. We're going to create another error here called case invalid data. And then up here, what we're going to throw, we're going to throw gh error.invalid data. And again, all I'm doing is giving you an example of how you can really customize your errors and let the user know exactly what is going wrong if something goes wrong. If you get this invalid data, 90% of the time, the reason this will fail to decode, right? Because what this line of code does here is it is trying to use our, our decoder here using Codable to decode the data we got back, which again is this JSON you see here, into a GitHub user object in Swift. That's what this whole section is doing. Now, it will fail, again, 90% of the time, there's many other reasons it can fail, because you didn't match your property names correctly. So our network call is written. Let me run through it again as a refresher, right? So we're calling git user. Uh, we marked it async, so we can use async await. We also marked it throws, because we want to throw a few errors, because again, so many things can go wrong uh, in a network call. And we're returning a GitHub user, and we need to know what endpoint to pass it to, right? So this is the user's endpoint. And again, where I got that from was the GitHub REST API documentation. I want to get a user, like you see here on the left, and you can see the URL for that that I already have highlighted is right here. So the documentation will let you know what URL you want to point to. So back to Xcode. Cool, I need to create a URL object from this string. And that's what we're doing here. As long as that's good, then I use my URL session to uh, get data from the URL. Again, this is an example of a get request where we're just downloading, right? We're not uploading anything, we're not editing anything, we're just downloading the data. And I need to pass in a URL that I created up here on line 32. Now, this returns a tuple of data and response. So again, the response is what we talk about first. This is all the, you know, 404 not found, 500. We want to check to make sure we have a 200. That's what we're doing here. That means everything was good to go. Cool. So if we don't get a 200, we're going to throw the invalid response error, show it to the user, you know, handle it. If this is good, we get a 200 back. Now we can work with our data here. So that's what we're doing here in this do try catch. We create a JSON decoder. And the reason I created it was so I could set the key decoding strategy. And because I want to convert from snake case, right? That's this avatar URL issue we had here. If I didn't have that uh, issue with snake case on avatar URL, I would not need this line of code right here. Okay, and then, like I said, we try to use that decoder to decode the JSON into a GitHub user and from that data, again, that's the JSON we got back. If that works, we're good to go. We're gonna return a GitHub user. The function worked properly. If we fail to decode, we're gonna throw the invalid data error. Okay, so that is our network call written. Now for step four is to actually use this network call and connect it to our UI to show the final results. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll up here to our Swift UI view. Remember, this is normally refactored, this Git user. This is probably in a view model somewhere, so it's not as messy, but uh, again, keeping it all in one place. So up to our view here, 
So in order to call this, I want to, below the padding here, we'll do a dot task. Now a dot task is used for, as you can see at the bottom here, adds an asynchronous task to perform before the view appears. It's kind of like on appear if you're familiar with SwiftUI, but it's ready to go for asynchronous code, for example, the, our async await network call. So that's what I want to do here. Uh, I want to call this, but I need to set a user equal to what we return, right? We're returning a GitHub user object, but I don't have the concept of that in my view. So we can do that real quick at state private var, we'll say user, and then it's of type GitHub user, and that is optional because when the view first loads, we don't have that, right? We don't have it until we make our network call. So in order to call our async network call here, I want to do do, and we'll say user equals try await get user. So this is us calling our network call right here. So when the view appears, oh, I need to have a, a catch here. Let's just put that in there for now. Uh, we're gonna handle the errors in a second. But yeah, so I am setting the user that I created here, and this is a state uh, variable, which means in SwiftUI, once my network call is completed and I set this user to the user I get back, then the UI will update, which we'll get to in a second. So I'm setting user equals to the result of my network call, which again, we went through that. I'm doing all that, parsing the JSON, setting the user, cool. So if it is successful, Great, I set the user to the user I get back, my UI updates. We gotta write the code for that in a second. But uh, if it's not successful, here's where I can handle the various errors. So I would do catch gh error.invalid URL. And then I would print, you know, invalid URL. Catch gh error.invalid response. And it, obviously you wouldn't just print this, you would show like a pop-up or, or do whatever you need to do in your app, you know, to let the user know what's going on. And then finally, catch gh error.invalid data. And, and again, I know this looks long and tedious, but hey, if you're gonna do proper error handling and showing the user exactly what's going on, it is long and tedious. I could just have one error be generic, you know, unable to complete the task at this time, please try again later. That's not helpful to the user. So you could be lazy and not do all this. That's not very good. And then we'll do our final catch, um, which is kind of like the catch all, we'll say unexpected error. Do a command B, should work. Okay, so like I said, this is just an example of uh, handling uh, very specific errors. Okay, so now that I have my user, the final step is to update the UI to take in the actual user data. So for example, username is not just text username, right? It would be user.login, and that is an optional. So we wanna provide a default thing. So we'll say login placeholder. Of course, if you're building a real UI, you'd wanna make this look nice, some placeholder. Now for the bio, again, user.bio, uh, and if that is nil, we'll say bio placeholder, whatever that is for you. Uh, and then now we need to handle our avatar URL, which for that, we're going to do async image, which is nice for uh, SwiftUI. We don't have to make a separate network call. SwiftUI is this async image already built in. Uh, it does take a URL. So we'll say URL from string, and that will be the user.avatar URL. And if that is, no, if our user's nil, instead of passing in the avatar URL, we'll pass in a blank string, which will give us a placeholder. That's what this placeholder is right here. And we'll use our circle here as the placeholder. That means while it's loading, or if the uh, URL comes back nil, then it'll just show that gray circle. Again, if you're designing your UI, make the placeholder nice looking. Let me actually take out this frame and put it on the async image itself so I can reuse that. Okay, so now I get back an image. So there's just a normal SwiftUI image, which means I can do things like dot resizable, dot aspect ratio, dot fit, and then finally dot clip shape of a circle, because I want it to be rounded. Okay, so to recap, uh, basically I created the async image, which will pull the user's avatar URL, create an async image from that. If that doesn't work, we'll show the circle placeholder. And then the text I'm using for the login will be the user's login. If that's nil, show the login placeholder. Same thing with the bio. So now when I run my preview, let's refresh it. It should make the network call. There you go, SLN0400. There's my profile picture. There's my bio. Let's try some other developers here. So I just need to change the username in the endpoint. Like I said, in a real app, maybe the user could type this in, uh, you know, however you want to do it in your app, but let's say two straws. Run it back, we should see Paul's stuff. Yep, there's Paul's profile picture, his username, his bio, uh, John Sundell. Run it, so you can see we're making our network call. It is working. And I know this video threw a lot at you with writing all the network calls, the async await, throws, you know, async image. Definitely don't be afraid to go back and rewatch it. Like I said at the beginning, network calls are a very tough topic. 
If you're just learning them, it's going to take you a while. You're going to have to watch many different videos. You're going to have to hear it explained many different ways. You're going to have to write 50 of them. Like this is a process. And again, this video was meant to be one of your first steps in that process. A very common iOS developer interview question is to explain the difference between classes and structs. I'm going to teach you the answer to that question by explaining value types and reference types. And I've got a nice little analogy using Google Sheets in Microsoft Excel to help you remember. And then I'll teach you when you should use classes and when you should use structs. Classes and structs are both ways to create objects in the Swift programming language. As you can see here, I have a class called car, which is creating an object. The car has a year, make, and model. More realistic examples in an app would be something like a user or a product. But for the sake of explaining this concept, we're going to stick with our simple car. So the main answer to this interview questions on classes versus structs is that classes are reference types and structs are value types. What does that even mean? Well, let's write some code to show you an example. So I have my car class here. Let's create a car. We'll say var my car equals, and I'll initialize the car. You can see I need to pass in a year, make, and model. So say 2022, make, Porsche, color, gray. So I've created a car with the year, make, and color. Because this is a class, this is a reference type. What that means is that it's a reference or a pointer to specific data. So for example, if someone steals my car, right? So if I do var stolen car equals my car, right? So I took this my car object and set it equal to stolen car. Well, now I have two variables. Again, it's a reference. They're both pointing to the same piece of data, which is this car here. So on the stolen car, if someone wants to make you know, my car a different color, it's going to affect the original my car. Let's see this here. So if I do stolen car dot color equals yellow, and then if I do print my car dot color, you notice I'm not printing stolen car dot color, I'm printing my car dot color. If I run that, you're gonna see my car dot color prints out yellow. And this is where the Google Sheet analogy will help you remember this. So the way a Google Sheet works, right, you share the sheet with multiple people, and then when multiple people make changes to that one source of truth, right, they can all make changes to that Google Sheet. It's a shared document. That's kind of how reference types work. Again, I changed the color property on the variable stolen car, but it also changed the property of color on the variable my car, and that's demonstrated on line 18 by printing out mycar.color. So again, classes are reference types, and if you create multiple variables of the same class, they're all gonna point to the same piece of data, and if you change that piece of data on any one of those variables, again, we have my car and stolen car, it is going to change that property for all of those variables that are all pointing to that same piece of data. That is a reference type. Now let's talk about structs and value types. So I'm gonna copy this class here, and then I'm gonna comment it out just so you don't lose all the code here. And then we'll paste that in here. Instead of a class being a car, we'll do a struct of a car. And then structs have memberwise initializers, that's another topic, so I don't have to have that in it. And I have my struct of a car, same thing. Again, they're both ways to create objects in Swift. But structs are value types. Remember, classes were reference types, structs are value types. When a value type gets passed around, it is copied. And this is where the analogy of the Microsoft Excel spreadsheet comes in, right? If I have my own Excel spreadsheet, I made all my changes to it, I save it, I make a copy of it, and I email that copy to you. Well, now when you get that copy, that's yours. You can make all kinds of changes to that spreadsheet. You can do whatever you want to it. It is not going to affect my original file version. So that is the analogy for value types, where again, reference types was like a Google Sheet, where everyone can make changes to the one source of truth. Let me demonstrate that in code. So I'll come up here, copy the my car variable. We're kind of gonna do the same example, but you'll see. Now if I do var stolen car equals my car, well now that it's a struct, that basically just made a copy of my car and assigned it to the variable stolen car. So now if I do stolen car dot color equals, we'll say red now. Now when I print my car dot color, again, my car was the original object that I created, it is still gonna be gray, I hope, right? <laughs> That's how it should work. Run it, gray, there it is, right? And if I did print stolen car dot color, now it's gonna print out red. Because again, struct is a value type, so it created a copy of my car and assigned it to stolen car, where again, as a class, the reference type, all pointed to the same underlying data. Now let's talk about when you should use a class versus a struct and the pros and cons of both. A benefit of classes is that they have what's called inheritance, which means I can subclass, so our car class up here, I can create a subclass of car, maybe called race car, that inherits all the basic properties of a car, right? Our year, make, color, but I can also add more properties to that, right? I can maybe add a 
number, right? Race cars have numbers and a team, race cars have teams. So you can see it gets all the basic car stuff, but I can add on the unique stuff that a normal car doesn't have, but a race car would have. That's called subclassing. And when you subclass, you inherit everything in the parent class. Another common example, and I'll show you some documentation that will help out here, is if you say class, my custom button, and that inherits from UI button. And if I option click on UI button, we'll go to the documentation. So when I make my custom button, I don't wanna reinvent the wheel, everything Apple has done to make a button work. Like look at all this stuff in the documentation that you, you get. Customizing color, edge insets, you know, setting the title. I'm gonna go down to the bottom here of all the uh, properties that are on it, right? Set title, title color, all the stuff that Apple has built in a button, you inherit when you create your custom button and then now you just add differences you want to make to make your button custom. Maybe you want it to be a circle and always be pink, who knows. But that's what you can do with inheritance. You can build on top of the UI button. Now that sounds like a really cool benefit, but as you can imagine, when you're inheriting everything of a UI button, which also inherits from UI view, you're starting to inherit a lot of bloat and extra baggage you may not need. So that is where structs come in in value types. If you don't need all that inheritance, you can just use a struct, and that's why structs are a lot more lightweight and performant. And if you've written Swift UI, you'll have noticed a lot of Swift UI is built on structs for that exact reason, right? A Swift UI view is a struct, so it can be created and redestroyed all the time, and it's not so heavy. So when you need inheritance or you need a reference type, that's when you go for a class. When you don't need inheritance, you want something lightweight and performant, then you go with a struct. Generics can be intimidating and confusing. Angle brackets, single letter types, protocol conformance, what's going on here? This video teaches you what generics are with a basic and real life example, and then we'll talk about the balancing act you have to do with generics. Because once you learn them, you're gonna wanna use them everywhere. But you can easily add unnecessary complexity to your code, so let's make sure you don't do that. Generics can eliminate code duplication by creating a general solution that can handle various types. Here's an abstract example to help illustrate the point. Let's say you have a function that can drive you home from work. This function will work no matter what the vehicle is, right? It doesn't care. It could be a motorcycle, a, a cyber truck, a Porsche 911 GT3. As long as it has a motor and wheels, the function will work. It doesn't care what type of vehicle it is. So you have the drive home function and then you have the angle brackets with the T colon and drivable in the middle. So this is a protocol conformance or a constraint on the generic. So inside the angle bracket, we call the generic something. Right now we're calling it T. That is convention to use a single letter variable. Typical T, sometimes U, sometimes V. You could, if you wanted to, like name it vehicle as you see here. But again, common convention is to just use the single letter T. So we're calling our generic T and then after the colon, we're constraining it or we're telling it what protocols it has to conform to. So like I said, our function will work. It doesn't care what the vehicle is as long as it has a motor and wheels. And that is our protocol, drivable. So you see drivable here requires a motor and wheels. And you see our function takes in the parameter called vehicle, which is of type T, which again is our generic. T can be any type as long as it conforms to drivable. So a quick example, you see I have a Porsche 911 GT3 object and a motorcycle object. Both of them conform to drivable. They both have motor and wheels. And then you can see I create a 911 by initializing the, the Porsche GT3. And I create a motorcycle by initializing the motorcycle. And then you can see I can use my function here by passing in either the 911 or the motorcycle. The function will work. It doesn't care what actual type it is as long as it conforms to drivable. That was a high level example just to introduce you to the topic. If you weren't quite following, we're gonna dive in deeper. So let's write a basic example all from scratch to practice this concept. We'll create a function called determine higher value. And if we wanna make it generic, that's where the angle brackets come in. And then like I said, we're calling our variable T or our generic T. And if you just want it to take literally any type, no constraints, this is enough, but we do wanna constrain our generic. And again, all constraining your generic means is it has to conform to a certain protocol. So we're gonna to conform to the comparable or comparable, whatever, <laughs> protocol. So again, we'll take any type as long as it conforms to comparable. And then we're gonna take in two parameters here. We'll say value one is of type T and then value two is also of type T. So they have to be the same type, right? I can't compare an int and a string, it has to be the same type. And now we'll determine the higher value. So we'll say let higher value equal, we'll do a ternary operator here, value one greater than value two. If that is true, 
value one will be the higher uh, value. And then if not value two, there might be a better way to write that. That looks repetitive, but whatever, not the point. So we'll say print higher value is the higher value. And you'll see us use this. Okay, so again, let's walk through the function signature. We're determining the higher value. We're saying, hey, we wanna take in a generic. Well, we're gonna name that generic T and then we're gonna constrain that generic. It has to conform to uh, comparable. Okay, cool. And then we take parameters, whatever parameters you want. Value one, that is of type T and value two is of type T. So they have to be the same type. So let's see this in action. So I will say determine higher value of, you know, three and eight. And then if I run it, you'll see eight is the higher value. Cool, that was an int. Now let's do strings of Sean and Swift. By the way, strings are alphabetical order when you compare them. So do that, it'll say Swift is the higher value because Swift comes after Sean alphabetically. So again, anything that's comparable, we do ints, floats, doubles, strings, even like look, dates. So I can do date.now or I can do, I don't wanna create a whole date, so I'll just do date.distant future, right? So the, the distant future date should be the higher value. So I'm gonna play this and we'll see <laughs> year 4001. So January 1st, 4001 is the higher value than right now. Oh, okay, so like I said, you're passing in strings, ints, doubles. It doesn't matter. This function will work as long as it conforms the comparable. Now, if I try to com uh, compare a date to uh, a string, like that's not going to work. You'll see me get an error. So it does have to be the same type. Again, that's why we're designating it T here. But as long as you're the same type, you have this one generic piece of code that can handle various specific types. And generics are all over the Swift language behind the scenes. Let's look at something you use all the time in an array. So I'm gonna say let numbers array, and I'm gonna declare it like this so I can dive into the documentation. I'll say array, repeating, Let's say I wanna repeat the number three 10 times, and you'll see over here, right, there's my array, all the threes. But the reason I did this is because I wanna dive into the documentation on array. So if I option click on array, open in developer documentation, you can see right here the declaration array has a generic of an element. So what that means is if I have an array of ints, I can still do things like uh, numbers array. Actually, I have to make numbers array a var if I'm going to manipulate it here. Numbers array dot append new element. And you can see it knows it's of type int right here. So if I append a four, I can do that to the numbers array. Now let's do var string array equals array. Again, repeating here this time we'll repeat Sean, and we'll just do it five times. So now I still have this dot append on array, right? I don't have to have a specific append function for strings and a specific append function for ints. Because an array is a generic of type element, I can do append, count, first of, all the stuff arrays have, no matter what the type is, whether it's an int or a string, right? So I can do string array dot append, and we'll say Swift, right? And that will still work. And then again, back to the documentation, that is because array is a generic of type element. So again, generics all over the Swift language behind the scenes. Now let's look at a real life example from an app I built for my course, GitHub Followers. The app, we pull down a list of followers. You can tap on a follower to see their information. So we have a network call called fetch user, as you can see here. Now I've removed all the error handling and the response validation to make this super simple code. Just know that if you're not familiar, a real network call is much more involved than this, but again, stripped it away for simplicity of generics. So this is not a generic function, right? We're calling fetch user from URL. It returns a specific type of user. And then you can see down here in the do try catch, we're decoding user.self. So this network call is very specific to users. However, it is very common in an app to make a network call to fetch an object and then decode it using codable. Very, very common. Like here's another example. If we were gonna do fetch repository, you can see very similar code, fetch repository. It returns a repository type. We make the network call. We decode it using uh, decodable repository.self. It's the same code, just swapping out user for repository. So instead of writing separate network calls for each specific type we have, right? This was only an example of two. What if we had five different types we were doing? We can make this generic as you see in this function signature. Again, the angle brackets after fetch data, we call our generic T, the constraint we put on the generic. And again, the generic constraint is just making it conform to a protocol. We want it to conform to decodable because we're fetching data from the server and we're decoding it. We need to pass in the type, this for t.type because we need to you know, let the network call know which type it's gonna be. And then we pass in the URL and then you can see we're returning T, which again is whatever type we pass in that conforms to decodable. And then you see the code is the same, right? We make our URL session share.data, make the network call. In the do try catch, 
we're decoding it, but instead of user.self or instead of repository.self, you can see it is t.self. So we're making the t the generic so we can pass in a user, a repository, or, or whatever other object we have, again, as long as it conforms to decodable. Now that you understand the basics of generics, let's talk about the balancing act, because once you learn this skill, you're gonna to wanna to put generics everywhere, right? Every little bit of repetitive code, you're gonna to wanna to make it a generic. Or the dreaded trap of, oh, let's future-proof this in case we write more network calls like this. Spoiler alert, most of the time when you future-proof, that future never comes. That's called premature optimization, and you should avoid it. Because adding generics everywhere can really add unnecessary complexity to your code. So here's my advice. Only use generics when it's such like a slam dunk use case, in my opinion. Even going back to our network calls and GitHub followers where we're fetching a user or fetching a repository. That was only two network calls that were exactly the same. Even if there's only two, I wouldn't use a generic because concrete types are way easier to read, way easier to understand what's going on. Now, like I said, if instead of just a user or a repository, maybe you're fetching a project or you know five other things from the GitHub API, and now you have five or six of these network calls that are all the same. To me, slam dunk case, use a generic, that's awesome. But again, if there's only one little bit of repetition, don't automatically throw generics at it. You're just overcomplicating things. We just scratched the surface on generics. They're a very deep and powerful topic. But hopefully this video gave you the fundamental understanding to start you on your journey of learning generics and help you answer that pesky interview question about generics. What are all these parentheses? What's up with these dollar signs? escaping, like who we running from? Trailing, closure syntax, what does that even mean? Look, closures are tough. These are all things that confuse the hell out of me way deeper into my career than I'd like to admit. Let's make sure you understand closures a lot faster than I did. Closures are self-contained blocks of functionality that can be passed around and used in your code. To put that simply, they're functions that can be passed around. To illustrate that, let's create a closure and put it to good use. Here I am in my Xcode playground, all I have is an object of a student that has a name and a test score, and then I have an array of those student types. We're gonna create a closure to filter out the students by their test score. Var top student filter, and that is of type. Now of type is the key word here to explain this because just like our student has a name that is of type string, a test score that is of type int, our closure is a variable that is of type, and this is where the parentheses come in. It's essentially the function signature. So I'm gonna type this out and we'll walk through and explain it. So you get one set of parentheses and then the return type is the other set of parentheses and that equals and then the actual curly braces to define the scope. So let's walk through these parentheses one by one because I know this confused me greatly when I was first learning closures. So the first set of parentheses is any parameters the function takes in. However, we don't need to name them, we just need the type. So we wanna take in a type of student. Now, of course, if you're doing something with an int or a string, that's where you would pass this in. We're dealing with our custom type here of student, so that's why we passed in that. And then this is going to return a Boolean. I'm gonna back up and explain this real quick because you may have seen, you know, sometimes it doesn't return anything. So you may see empty parentheses or sometimes if it doesn't return anything, you can see void as well. Those empty parentheses and void are the same thing, just two different ways to say it. In our case, we're gonna pass in a Boolean because this is a filter. We're going to look at our student and if our student has a score of greater than 80, we're gonna return true. That means they're our top student. So that's why we passed in a student and returned a Boolean. We just wanna check if they have a score greater than 80. So return student, but we can't do this quite yet. We're missing a piece here where we need to name our parameter here, student in. You've seen this before. So this is basically the parameter name. So we can use it down here in the scope of our closure. So I can do return student.testscore. I don't know why the autocomplete is not cooperating, but greater than 80. Let me run it real quick just to make sure I didn't miss anything. Should be good. Cool, everything is good to go. And actually maybe this will help. Let's write this as a function so you can compare the two because I'm assuming you're familiar with functions a bit. So I just copied and pasted that. So to write a function, right, it's func top student filter. I'm gonna put an F after it for function. And then instead of having all this right here, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that, right? You would say, hey, this takes in a student of type student. It returns a Boolean and here's our scope. And we would say return student.testscore greater than, we'll say 70. So to compare the, the function, and by the way, these are very similar. You can even use the function. You'll see we'll do that in a second. But I just kind of want to put these side by side so you can see how similar it is. Like I said, it's a property with a name, 
of type, just like, you know, string and int, the type here is the function signature, right? It takes in a type of student and returns a bool. That's what's going on here. Type of student returns a bool. And then here, the student is what we named it. We can name it whatever we want, just like we can name this parameter name anything we want. And then you see obviously in the scope is basically the same. So hopefully that clears up what these parentheses are when you see that in the closures. Again, it's just any parameters and what it returns, just like a function, parameters and what it returns. So now that we've defined our closure up here in top student filler, <laughs> filter, filter has a T, there we go. But anyway, now that we have our closure, we're gonna pass it around using our variable. So let's do that. Let's say let top students equal students, by the way, students is our array up here. This is our array of all of our students, dot filter, and you can see our filter takes in a closure. And just like we said, here is the type, takes in a student, and it returns a Boolean. So the only way we're gonna be able to pass in our closure is if it matches that perfectly, right? Takes in a student and returns a Boolean. Let's say our closure up here had a student and an int, right? By the way, this is how you can have multiple types, maybe student-age, if you had multiple types in your closure, I guess it'd be multiple parameters. Now our closure wouldn't work because it doesn't match exactly. So I'm gonna delete that because I want it to work. So now I can just pass in top student filter. And now let me paste in a quick little for loop to save some time, just basically just prints off the student name. We'll run it and that filter should work. Yes, we have Luke, Leia, and Ahsoka. Those scores have to be greater than 80, right? Luke has an 88, Leia 95, Ahsoka an 86. So our filter is working by passing in our closure there. Again, closure is a function that can be passed around. And this is a lot neater than if we wrote it out. So let's demonstrate that. Well, real quick, let me demonstrate how we can also pass in this function. So let me do top student filter with a capital F at the end, right? That's what this is up here. And then now when I run it, remember we're greater than 70. This is why I did this, so we can differentiate. So now when I run it, I should get a longer list of students, which I do because more students up here are greater than 70. So again, whether it's a property or a function, very similar. A closure is a function that can be passed around and used. Now that you've seen that, let's start talking about shorthand and what all these dollar signs mean. So I'm gonna rewrite this filter here or re-auto-complete it here. So filter is included. So as you can see, this is gonna give me a closure that takes in a student and returns a Boolean. If I hit return, I get a little bit of the shorthand and it automatically goes to trailing closure syntax, which we'll talk about more in a little bit, but the introduction, if I do command Z, Trailing closure syntax is when you can omit this argument label when your closure is the last argument. We'll talk a lot about that in SwiftUI because SwiftUI uses that heavily a little bit more in the video, but our closure is our only parameter. So of course it's our last parameter. So when I hit return, we get trailing closure syntax, which is omitting the parameter names in the parentheses and just going right into the body of the closure like that. So now we have our argument name and we don't have to define the type, the reason we don't have to define the type is because it knows it's running filter on an array of students, right? Our students array right here has type inference. It knows it's an array of students. It's not an array of strings, it's not an array of doubles or anything like that, it's students. So that's why we don't need to define the type and we can just call this whatever we want. You can see the capital S for student means it's the student type. We're gonna name it lowercase student just as the name. Again, we could have named this person, right? You can name it whatever you want. Student obviously makes the most sense, but we know it's of type student. So here we can write the same code. So I'm using simple one lines of code, but obviously this could have been 40 lines. It could have been super complex filtering code. That is why you might not want to write it out all at once. You might want to put it away into a property so it can be reused, passed around very easily versus right now I'm writing it out like on site within the scope of the filter. Again, it looks fine right now because it's just one line of code. But I wanna use this simple example to show you the shorthand. These parameters come with a built-in shorthand syntax. You've probably seen dollar sign zero or dollar sign one. What that represents is each parameter here. So right now we only have one, so it's dollar sign zero. In a second, I'll show you an example where we have dollar sign zero and dollar sign one. So how I can slowly make this shorthand is if I don't wanna use the actual named property here, get rid of that and get rid of the end. And then now instead of student down here, I can replace that with dollar sign zero. Because I only have one argument, there is no dollar sign one, it's just dollar sign zero, so I know that's the student. And now when we only have one line of code, we can omit the return. And if we're gonna omit the return, we can put this all on one line to be nice, neat, and clean. So that's your introduction to the shorthand and what the dollar sign zero and the dollar sign one is. So right now we just have top students. We filtered out all the top students based on if their test score is greater than 80. Now let's actually sort this so you can see an example of dollar sign zero and dollar sign one and just more repetition on closures because again, closures are, are tough. So let's say let student ranking equal top students. So we only want to take the top students dot sorted by. And here again, you can see this is an example when we have two of these parameters. We have student one and student two and it returns a Boolean. So if we were to write a closure for this one, we would have to make sure we had two students in it, right? So we'd have to be student 
student, and then of course we would write different logic to do all the sorting here. But like I said, I just want to point out that, oh, and we would also here have to have student two. But I wanted to point out that if you are going to use a closure in a built-in like sorted or filter, it has to match exactly, or if you wrote a function yourself, it has to match exactly. So I'm gonna do a command Z to get our closure back to that. And I'm gonna hit return and walk through that shorthand again. So like I said, you could have student one, student two, and then do return student one dot test score greater than student two dot test score. And this will sort them based on whose test score is higher. But again, back to the shorthand, we don't need student one, student two. I know that is dollar sign zero and dollar sign one. So we can get rid of that to make it cleaner. And then I'll replace student one with dollar sign zero and student two with dollar sign one. Now, if you had three or four parameters up there, it'd be dollar sign two, dollar sign three, and so on. Like I said before, we don't need the return, so we can put this on one line, and there you go. So like I said, if you've seen a lot of these closures with the dollar signs and dollar sign one, dollar sign two, those are essentially shorthand syntax for each property like we just showed with the student and student one and student two. I hope that cleared up all the dollar sign syntax for you. I know that was confusing for me as well when I was starting out. Let's talk about trailing closure syntax before we get on to escaping. Let's go to a SwiftUI project to see how this is everywhere in SwiftUI. Here I am in my course called dubdubgrub. By the way, you can check this out, seanallen.teachable.com if you're interested. If you've ever written a V stack or an H stack in SwiftUI, you've used trailing closure syntax. And if you've written a lot of SwiftUI, You've done that many, many times. So let me explain that. Here I am in just a, a basic little button. Let's say I wanted to put this text in a V stack. So I do that, V stack, cool. Now, when you wrote the V stack, you just did open curly brace, close curly brace. And you probably thought nothing of it if you didn't understand trailing closures, but that's what it is. It's a trailing closure. So let's talk about what a V stack really is. So if I do V stack, hold option to get all the parameters there, right? They're just optional. And SwiftUI is riddled with optional parameters and default values. I'll show you that in a second. But what I want to point out to you is, hey, cool, here's a parameter. You can do dot leading, spacing, we'll say 10. But look, what does it end with? It ends with content. And what does that syntax look like to you? That looks like a closure. And the closure is the last argument. So we can omit it and just do the trailing closure syntax, which is just going right into the body of the closure, the braces. And real quick to show you, if I command click onto the V stack, jump to definition, Go to the init here. You can see the alignment has a default value of dot center. Spacing, default value of nil. So like I said, default values are everywhere in SwiftUI. That's what allows that clean syntax. And here you go. Does this look familiar? Well, add view builder, that's a different topic. But you can see the last argument is a content. That closure looks familiar, right? It takes in no parameters and it returns of type content. So back to the V stack real quick. That is why we can get rid of this. And that's why you can write a V stack, which is a simple V stack, open curly brace, close curly brace, trailing closure syntax all over Swift UI. If you've ever written a network call prior to async await, you've dealt with completion handlers or closures, they're the same thing. Let's take a look at this function signature for get followers. By the way, this goes up to the GitHub API, pulls down a list of followers to display on screen. Okay, so parameters, username, page, completed though. This is the closure here and it's marked at escaping. We're gonna talk about what that means. But to review the closure, right, our closure takes in a result type and the result type returns a follower or a GFR and then it returns void. So it doesn't return anything. So again, like I said, this could easily be just closed parentheses, same exact thing. But why is it marked at escaping? Well, the closures that we were doing before, like when we were filtering the students, those happen instantly, right? They get called right away, they happen right away, no big deal. On network calls, this fires off and it goes up into the cloud to GitHub API and depending on your network, right? It could be super slow, could take 10 seconds, could take a millisecond, maybe you're not even connected to the internet, could take forever. So what escaping does is it allows the closure to live on past the lifetime of the function that called it. Speaking of the function that called it, let's actually go look at that. So on the follower list VC, which is that screen, you can see here in the get followers function, I call network manager .share .get followers. And again, as you see here, we're using the trailing closure syntax because that is the last argument in the function. But what happens, get followers fires off and then that function is done. However, the closure is still living. It outlives the function because it is waiting to get the information back from the network call. So that is why you mark it at escaping so it can live on past that. Now this is where things get a little tricky with retain cycles and memory leaks because most of the time when you do a network call, you're capturing a reference to self. Because once you get the list of followers back, whether it's 10 seconds later, 15 seconds later, one second later, you have to update the UI on the phone. So our closure still has to have a reference to whatever called it. In this case, it's a view controller in UI kit. So that's why you gotta be careful with escaping closures. We marked it weak self here, so it's a, a weekly held reference so it can break. 
that gets into memory management, automatic reference counting, all that stuff. That's a whole other topic. I have a video on that. I'll link to that in the description if you want. But that's what escaping means. Essentially, the closure has to live on past the life of the function that originally called it. If this was helpful and you enjoyed my teaching style, check out my courses at seanallen.teachable.com. See you in the next video. We're talking about filter, map, reduce. I'll show you how to chain them together. Then we're going to talk about compact map and flat map. A good way to think about these higher order functions is they are shorthand syntax for a basic for loop. Filter, map, and reduce iterate over an array and spit out their results into a new variable. So I'm going to need an array, so I'm gonna copy and paste that here. As you can see, I have an app portfolio of my object here of an indie app, which has a name, monthly price, and users. And as you can see, I've created four indie apps with uh, different names, monthly prices, and number of users, and thrown them into an array called App Portfolio. This is the array that we're going to use with the examples on filter, map, and reduce. Let's dive into filter first. So let's say I wanna filter through my portfolio of indie apps and pull out the free apps. So right now, Fit Hero with a monthly price of zero is the only free one. So let's say let free apps equals, say app portfolio, so this is the array that I'm gonna iterate over, dot filter, and you can see it takes in a closure, and a simple way to write this is with a trailing closure. I'll explain that in a second. So we'll do dollar sign zero dot monthly price equals equals 0, 0.00. A brief explanation of this trailing closure is the dollar sign zero is every item in the array. For example, the first iteration over the app portfolio array is the indie app creator view. Dollar sign zero, the second iteration equals fit hero. Dollar sign zero over the third iteration equals buckets and so forth. So it's gonna check every element's monthly price and if it is equal to zero, it's going to spit it out into this free apps array. So when I come down here in print free apps, in the console down here, you should see just Fit Hero printout. Indie app, Fit Hero, monthly price of zero. But the way filter works is you just need to pass in a conditional. So this has to equate to true or false. As you can see, it equals equals zero or not. So let's try another one. Uh, users, let's say if users is greater than 5,000. And instead of free apps, we'll call this high users, right? I wanna filter all my apps by which ones have high users. So now when I run it, you should see the array here, buckets has 7,598 users, connect four has 34,000 users. So again, it filtered out all the apps with high users based on this conditional that I passed into the filter. And as I said in the intro, these are basically shorthand syntax for for loops. You could do the same thing by doing this very basic for loop here, right? You have an array called high users. You go for app in app portfolio. So it's gonna iterate over all these apps. It's gonna say if app.users is greater than 5,000, Go ahead and append that app to the high users array up here, and then we'll print out high users. If I print this again, we should see the same thing, buckets and connect four, same thing we just got. So essentially what filter is, is a way to take these, you know, whatever, five lines of code, we'll delete that, and to put it into a nice one-liner. All right, now let's talk about map. So a very common use of map is to pull out all of a specific property. So let's say I wanted to pull out just the names of the indie apps, put them in a list and sort them alphabetically. So we'll say let app names equals app portfolio dot map. And then again, you pass in the closure, dollar sign zero dot name. And then now if I print app names, I'm gonna comment out the filter print so we don't jumble up the console here and, and get confused here. So print app names, you see creator view, fit hero, buckets, connect four, so again, map went in, just pulled out all the names. I could have pulled out all the prices. I could have pulled out all the users and put that into its own array. And then now that you have that into its array, you can also do dot sorted, right? And then now that will put it in alphabetical order. So you can see, pulled out all the names of the array and sorted them in alphabetical order. Let me actually run it. See buckets, connect for creator view, all in one simple line of code. So again, shorthand syntax for basic for loops. Now that's the example of pulling out a specific property, but let's say I wanted to add a transform to that property. Let's say I wanted to do increased prices. So I can do app portfolio map over that array. Instead of dollar sign zero dot name, I want to do dollar sign zero monthly price, but I want to multiply it by 1.5. Let's say I want to pull out all my prices and then also multiply them by 1.5. So another aspect of map is it'll iterate over that and apply a transform or an operation to each element. So now instead of print app names, I'm gonna print increase prices. We'll run it and you're gonna see an array of all my prices that have been multiplied by 1.5 if I were to increase them. Okay, on to reduce and then we're gonna start with a super basic example and then I'll show you a little more what we can do. So super basic, let's say let numbers equal, I don't know, three, five, nine, 12, 18. 
So what reduce does, it will reduce all these values into one. And the most common way that you use reduce is to you know, sum up an array. So say I wanted to get the total sum of all these numbers. So say let sum equal numbers dot reduce. And then reduce has a very tricky autocomplete, but again, you can pass in simple closure here. So we do a starting value. So I have an int, so I want my starting value to be zero. We're gonna come back to this in a second. And an operator, so I'll do plus. So the plus means I want to sum them all up. So now if I print sum, and then let's comment out increase prices so we don't clutter up the console. Now when I run that, you will see the sum of numbers is 47. 18, 12, 3, 9, and 5 is 47. Now, again, remember the initial value was zero. Let's say I wanted the initial value to be 100. So now it's gonna add, basically gonna add 47 to 100. So I get 147. So you can start with an initial value and then whatever you wanna do. Now let's say I wanted to subtract the total of this array from 100. Now instead of a plus, I do a minus. Now it's gonna be 100 minus 47, which as you can see is 53 down there. So the simplest version of reduce, we're gonna do a little more complex version in a second, but the simplest version of reduce, again, you start with an initial value and then you add an operator in here. Okay, now let's do a little more complex uh, example. Let's say in my app portfolio, I want to get just the total number of users, right? I wanna add up all the users from each of my indie apps. So here we can do let total users equal app portfolio, again, that's this array up here that we're, we've been working with, dot reduce. And again, the initial value, we wanna start with zero. And then now we wanna pass in another closure to add these two together. So we can do dollar sign zero plus dollar sign one. I'll explain this in a second, dot users. And then here we will print total users. So this operation we're passing in here, again, remember I told you dollar sign zero is the placeholder for each iteration through the array. Dollar sign one is the next iteration. So you're adding those two together. So when you're adding them up, you're adding here in creator view, you're adding four, three, five, six to one, seven, five, six. Then you're adding that to seven, five, nine, eight. So that you're, you're going through and adding those together. That's what the dollar sign zero and dollar sign one mean. So when we print total users, we're gonna get that number. Uh, again, let me comment out some and it's 47,791. That is the total users of all my app. And again, we went through and reduced just the user's property of the app portfolio down to one variable called total users. Now let me show you how you can chain, filter, map, and reduce together to do some complex calculations all on one line. Now a little caveat here, this can get a little uh, messy if you take this too far. So always consider code readability versus trying to get everything on one line. That's my caveat, but I just wanna show you an example of what's possible, and I'll let you use your judgment on what's readable code and what's not. So let's try to figure out our recurring monthly revenue. So each of these apps has a monthly price, right? $11.99, $3.99, and they have a number of users. So monthly recurring revenue for each app is you know, monthly price times number of users. But we wanna get the total for a whole portfolio, not just each app. So we gotta do some combinations here. So for chaining, we can say let recurring revenue equal app portfolio dot map. So the first step we're going to do is for each item in the array, we're going to multiply monthly price times dollar sign zero dot users. Now we have a little uh, issue here because if you look, monthly price is a double, users is an int. So we're going to have to cast our int to a double so we can multiply that. Once we've mapped each of our apps uh, recurring revenue, again, monthly price times users, then we're gonna tack on a reduce at the end of that to total up that array to get our total monthly recurring revenue for our whole portfolio. That's the process that we're gonna do here. So what it's saying here is I need to make this a double so we can cast the dollar sign users to a double. So now if I print, just to show you these steps here, if I print recurring revenue, let's comment out total users. So if I print recurring revenue, what you're gonna see is an array of the recurring revenue for each app. So this is Creator View's recurring revenue, Fit Hero zero, you know, buckets was 30,000. Now, by tacking on a reduce, I can sum up this total to get the overall portfolio recurring revenue. Again, you can just chain them. So the map, like I said, spits out its result into a variable. Well, that variable can be held like temporarily in memory if you tack on another reduce here. And then we wanna start with zero, and then this is just a simple version, right? We just add the plus. We wanna sum that up. So what happens is we, map out and get each app's recurring revenue, and then we tack on a reduce at the end, and then the result of that will, will get spit into recurring revenue, and then we're gonna print out recurring revenue. So if I run this, this should spit out one number for my overall app's recurring revenue, so 150,000 for my app portfolio. And if you wanted to know what it's gonna be after Apple's cut, you can you know, multiply each one by 0.7, because that's all you're gonna get, or if you wanted to account for taxes, all that stuff, 
So now we're taking each app's recurring revenue, multiplying it by 70% because that's you know the developer cut. Then we're reducing that, run it again. Now our 150 grand a month turned into 105,000 a month. So like I said, you can combine maps, filters, reduces, but as you can also see, this code gets to be uh, quite unreadable, especially to newer developers. So like I said, be careful with this power, but just, you know, they can be combined. And for certain situations, it makes for a super clean one-liner, but it can get out of hand. Now let's talk about compact map and flat map. These are relatively new additions to, to Swift. I shouldn't say I'm getting old. It's like Swift 4 point something, <laughs> but they weren't around from the beginning. So to put these really simple, what compact map does is it removes nils from an array. Let me show you an example. We'll say let nil numbers, which is an array of int, but they're optional, right? Maybe, you know, in your array, you have one, nil, 17, nil, three, seven, nil, 99, right? For some reason, when you get an array, you can either have nil or a number, but when you want to use this array, you just want to get rid of all those nils and only deal with the numbers. So to do that, let non nil numbers equals nil numbers dot compact map. And then you just pass in the closure of dollar sign zero. And then now if I print non nil numbers, let me comment out recurring revenue, uh, run that, print the non nil numbers. You can see I get one seventeen three seven ninety nine. just got rid of the nils. So again, the simple way to remember compact map is it filters out the nils. Now for flat map, again, a simple way to remember this is that if you have an array of arrays, it flattens them into a single array. Let's take a look. Let array of arrays, and that is gonna be of type an array of int. So that's how you do an array of arrays equals, and I'll keep these short to keep the typing to a minimum. So you see, I have an array of arrays, right? Each array is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So what flat map does is let's say, let single array equals array of arrays dot flat map. And again, dollar sign zero. So now if I print single array, let's run that. And you can see it took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and put it all into one array where it had an array of arrays. So you can imagine if maybe you have a bunch of different groups of numbers and you gather them all together into array and you're like, I don't care about each array. I just want to know the total. There you go. Flat map is there. And let's say before you flatten the array, you wanted to do something to the array. Well, you can do that in the closure here. So you can do a map and then pass in another closure. Again, we're getting to some complex examples. We'll say dollar sign zero times two. So I'm gonna tell you what this is. So within the flat map, I passed in a map to where each item in the subarrays, the one, two, three, the four, five, six, the seven, eight, nine, I wanna multiply those by two, right? I wanna double those. And then after I double them, flatten that into a single array. So now when I print single array, instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you're gonna get all those numbers in a single array, but doubled. So run that, should get two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Yep, there you go. When you need a collection of something in Swift, you instinctively reach for an array, don't you? Stop it. Stop and think, would a set work here? Because if it does, you get some serious benefits, like much better performance and some really powerful methods to help you compare different sets. Today, you're gonna to learn the differences between sets and arrays and when you should use each, which is a very common interview question, by the way, as well as some superpowers of sets that you probably didn't know about. Let's compare sets versus arrays. Both are collections, but here are the key differences. An array can have duplicate items in it. For example, if you had a list of first names in a class, you could have the same first name more than once. An array is always in the same order. That example of students in a class again, this array you see here, that order is not gonna change unless you do something to change it, of course. Every time you access this student's array, that order is going to be the same. That's why arrays are less performant than sets is because it keeps that order. Anytime you wanna look up an item in the array or do any manipulation on the array, it has to check every item in that array. So the time complexity is O of N, which basically means as the array grows larger and larger and larger, the longer it will take to do these lookups or mutations. The key differences for a set are that it can have no duplicates. So like that student's example where we had multiple first names, well a set, nope, you can only have one of each item. Sets are also unordered. So anytime I access this student set, that order is not guaranteed. I'm gonna get a different order every time probably. Now you may be thinking, well, having duplicates and having everything always be in the same order, those are really desirable attributes of an array. 
But again, remember the trade-off. That makes arrays less performant. Whereas a set, when it's unordered, everything is unique, and everything in a set has to conform to hashable. And this allows for constant time lookup. So remember the array, if you wanted to look something up or, or map over the array, the time that takes will be proportionate to how large the array is. Whereas a set, whether the set has 10 items in it or 10,000 items in it, that lookup time will be the same, it will be constant time. So if you're dealing with small data, you know, there's only 10 to 20 items in an array, it's probably irrelevant, but if you start dealing with really large arrays, this is something you must know. These are the key differences you need to know between a set and array. But sets also have some really cool methods I'm gonna show you. So not only do you get better performance with a set, you get these really powerful methods that help you compare and pull out data from various sets. Let me show you some examples in code. Here in my playground, I have four different sets, as you can see. I have one called SwiftUI Devs, Swift Devs, Kotlin Devs, and Experience Devs. And you can see some of the names overlap. So imagine we have lists of various developers that have these qualifications, and we want to compare these sets to pull out you know, common items or make sure one group is not in another group. Now, of course, these examples are real simple. There's only two to five names in it. But as I'm doing these examples, imagine you had a set with a thousand names in it. First up, let's see where two sets overlap. For example, I wanna see experience devs and Swift UI devs. Now you can probably tell just by looking at it right now that Sean is the only one that overlaps, but let me show you the code to pull that out. Again, imagine you had a list of a thousand names, you know, you wouldn't be able to just look at it. So we wanna say, let experienced Swift UI devs equal Swift UI devs. That's this set here on line three. We can say dot intersection of, and you see you pass in another set, experience devs. So what this is going to do is it's going to see where the overlap is between an experience devs and Swift UI devs, and it's gonna put it out into its own set here. So if I run this, you can see over on the right, the only one that's gonna be in there is Sean, because that is the only one that is in Swift UI devs and experience devs. So like I said, if you had a list of a thousand names and you wanted to see which names are on both lists, simple little one-liner to pull out all those names. Again, this is the, the power of sets, and I have a bunch more examples to show you of the cool stuff you can do. Next up is kind of the opposite of intersect, is subtract. So let's say I wanted a Swift developer that wasn't experienced. Maybe I wanted a junior developer specifically. So that's what I want to check for. They want to be in the Swift dev set, but not in the experience dev set. So that's what we're going to check out. So we can say let junior Swift dev equal Swift devs dot subtracting experience devs. So now when I run it, you'll see the only name, I believe it's just, just James. I believe James is my only junior developer here. Yep, there it is, James. So if you look at the experience devs, you got Sean, Ava, Olivia, Leo, Maya, and you see Olivia, Maya, Leo, they're all in there, Sean's in there. The only one that's not an experience dev is James. So you can see you can subtract the differences between two very large lists. And just to show you that, let me take out Maya from the experience devs real quick and run it again. And then now you'll see James and Maya because Maya is no longer in the experience devs. Another cool one here is disjoint. So we can check to see if there, there's any overlap between two sets. And this returns a Boolean. So I'll say Swift UI devs dot is disjoint with Kotlin devs. If there's not an overlap, it will return true. If there is an overlap, it will return false. So you can see the Swift UI devs are Sean and James. And the Kotlin devs, Olivia, Elijah, Leo, Maya, Maya, Dan, there's no overlap, so that returns true. Now, if I change Kotlin devs to Swift devs, there is gonna be an overlap, so is disjoint returns false. So again, if you had a huge list and you wanna make sure there's no overlap between the lists, there you go, disjoint is for you. Now, union is a way to combine two sets. So for example, Swift UI devs and Swift devs, ah, that's fairly similar. Let's just combine that into one list. But you know, in a set, you can only have one name. So if I were combining two arrays, I would end up with two Sean's and two James in this combined array. But because I want uniqueness in this set, when I do this union, it will compare these two sets and combine them, but it will actually turn into the, the Swift devs array because you know Sean and James are already in there, but that's what it will do. It will do Swift UI devs dot union with Swift devs. And if I go down here and run it, you will see over here, Sean, James, Olivia, Maya, Leo, and again, that is the Sean, James, Olivia, Maya, Leo, because we just combined these two, we unioned them. Now let's say we want to compare the two lists of names and we want to see who only belongs to one list, right? Let's take Swift devs and Kotlin devs. Say we don't want someone who's like cross-platform developer, kind of knows a little bit of both. We want specialist. We want someone who only focuses on Swift dev or only focuses on Kotlin dev. So again, we can see if they're exclusive only to one of them. So I can say Swift devs dot it's a symmetrical difference of Kotlin devs. 
Now here, this will give me, whoops, I gotta call this something, let specialists, right? I gotta, this will spit out another set here. So run that and you'll see who are the specialists? Elijah, Sean, James, and Dan. And you can compare the Swift devs and the Kotlin devs and you can see Elijah's only a Kotlin dev, Sean is only a Swift dev. So you can see they're the unique ones to the two lists. So like I keep saying, if you had two super large lists of names and you wanted to do all these comparisons, sets are just a lifesaver. These little one-liners spit out so much good stuff. And I saved the uh, simple ones for last. So subset, if you know what the word subset means, pretty self-explanatory. So it returns a Boolean. So you can say Swift UI devs dot is subset of Swift devs. This is gonna return true, right? Cause you can see Sean and James in Swift devs are in Swift UI devs. So Swift UI devs is a subset. But this is a quick, again, little one-liner check. If you wanna see if something is a subset, that should return true. And then let's change Swift devs to Kotlin devs. And then that should return false because Swift UI devs is not a subset of that. Superset is basically the reverse. So you do Swift devs dot is superset. So that means if it's a superset of the subset of Swift UI devs, this should return to true. Again, because Swift UI devs being the superset contains Swift UI devs. Run it just to check. True. Again, so subset, superset checks, pretty simple. And then insert, delete, and find. Say Swift devs dot insert new member. We'll say Joe goes into Swift devs. Now remember, the order doesn't matter. On an array, you append it to the end. You're just inserting it here and then the order gets jumbled up. But there you go, you can insert Joe or I can do Swift devs dot remove. Let's remove Sean. And I can do Swift devs dot contains Maya. And then here I will print Swift devs down here. So now when I run this, you can see I've inserted uh, Joe. I've removed Sean. So Swift devs does contain Maya is true. And now the new Swift devs set that has added Joe and removed Sean. There you go. There's Joe and there's no more Sean. So again, insert, remove, contains. Those are the constant times, super performant things on a set. Again, if you have a super large data set. I'm teaching you about optionals. I'm gonna show you four different ways to unwrap them. We're gonna talk about optional chaining. And then I'm gonna show you some examples of how these are used in a real code base. An optional in Swift is something that can either have a value or be nil. For example, our app could have a user object where the age is optional. And that's because in our app, we don't require the user to enter their age, but they can if they want. So our code needs to be able to handle both situations. Hey, is the age actually gonna have a value or is it going to be nil? And that's what this question mark denotes. A good analogy is to think of this age property that has a question mark as a box that's closed. You don't know if that box is gonna contain a nil or you don't know if that box is gonna actually contain the integer value of 41. And the way we handle that in our code is by unwrapping the optional. So here's our user object that I mentioned before. Let's create a user real quick. Let user equal a user. We'll initialize that with a name of Sean and the age is nil. So the first way we're gonna to learn to unwrap is with the if let. And I'll tell you about the pros and cons of each of these methods as we go. So for the if let, we can do if let age equal user dot age and you see user dot age age is the optional you see that question mark down there so what this means i'm going to run through this so when we say if let age we're creating a new property to store the value in if user dot age has a value we're going to store it in this variable called age if it's nil it goes into the else block because age could be you know 41 or it could be nil so if we have the value here we can say print users age is, and then we'll print out the age because it has a value. So it'll go into the else block if user.age is nil. So we can now print user did not enter an age. So if I run this, we're gonna go into the else block because look, Sean's age is nil, this user that we created on line nine. That's the user we're using right here. So if I run it, you see user did not enter an age. So now if I change on line nine, my age to 41 and I run it, you're gonna see it's gonna go into line 14, user's age is 41. So this is us unwrapping the optional. Like I said, we don't know if it has a value or not. So we have to handle both situations. If it has a value, cool. And we just did a print statement, but you can imagine there being like a whole 50 lines of code doing whatever you need to do down here, right? We just did a simple print statement. And then else if it's nil, maybe you wanna show an error, or do something here in the else block. Now a downside to using if let, again, I'm gonna talk about the pros and cons is you have to use age within this scope. 
So what it means, if you have uh, some logic, right? Like say you wanna do like if age greater than 40, you know, do something. Now you can see we're starting to get pretty nested here. I'm gonna delete this to clean that up uh, with our code. And it can be very hard to read. So if lets, if they get out of control can lead to this pyramid of doom that you see here. So that is one of the downsides. Now, of course, if you just have a simple, you know, one line of code in here and it's not super nested, great, go for it. But a way to prevent that pyramid of doom is to use guardlet, and that'll be the next example. So for guardlet, you need to use a function because one of the features of guard is an early exit from the function. So let's create a function called check age, and that takes in an int. And we're basically just gonna do an age check, like if they're over a certain age, we can do something in our app, whatever that is. But we don't know if age has a value, so we wanna unwrap that optional. So we wanna do guard let age equal age else return. So I'll say print age is nil. So guard, like I said, is good for the early exit from the function because let's say we're doing a bunch of code down here. Like again, like if age is greater than 40, you know, do something. But because this logic relies on there actually being an age, we basically say, hey, if age is nil, just return. Don't even do all this code below. I like to refer to this as like the line in the sand, the guard statement. If the guard statement fails, it's just gonna return and none of the code below it will execute. So again, it provides that early exit, which is nice. And it av avoids the pyramid of doom because once you have your age variable here, now you can use that within the entire scope of the function. Whereas if let, remember, you had to use it within this scope right here, just the top part of the if statement, and then that could get super nested. But with the guard statement, you can use it in, you know, in the whole scope of the function. Now, something that's new in Swift 5.7, I believe, is this boilerplate of guardlet age equals age. You've seen you know, everywhere if you've been coding for a little bit. Now you can just do guardlet age if the naming works out. For example, up here, the naming doesn't work out. I can't just do if let age because we're using user.age. That adds a little extra thing. But in the very common boilerplate example where you have to do like if let age equals age or guardlet age equals age, you no longer have to have that same name. It'll just use this variable name that you use there. So let's run this function here, check age, and we'll pass in user.age, because that is the, right now it's 41, so it does have a value. Let me actually add a print statement in here, you are old. <laughs> Let me comment out these print statements so we don't get confused in the console. So we'll run it. Because there is an age, right, it should go past the guard statement, right, because it's it is not nil. So it should say you are old, right? It went in, age is greater than 40, you are old. Now if I go up to line nine again here, make my age nil, it's not gonna make it past the guard statement. So run it. So basically if age is nil, it's gonna go into this age is nil, as you can see here, and then it's gonna exit from the function. So this code never even runs in that situation, which of course for us is just one simple little line, but I mean, there could be like network calls, there could be a whole bunch of code that relies on you having a uh, property here. So you can definitely save running all that code if you don't need to. Okay, moving on to nil coalescing. So nil coalescing is great to provide an easy default value. So I can say, let age equal user dot age, double question mark or zero. So what I'm saying here is, hey, check user dot age, which remember up here right now it is nil. I'm gonna comment out all this if let stuff to stop all the errors and stuff. So right now my age is nil. So if I say let age equals user dot age, that is nil. So what it does, it provides a default value. It says, hey, if this is nil, here, give it this default value and put that into age. So if I were to print age down here, and let me get rid of these print statements again so we're not confused. Run it. Now age is zero, gives me the default value because it's nil. Now if I go up and change Sean's age to 41 and run it, now age is 41 down there. Now I wanna go back to what I said, a easy default value. And this is a case where it might not make sense because providing a default value of zero for the age could mess up some calculations or things you're doing in your app. So a place where it may make sense is if you say let name equal well, let me actually go back up to the user. Let's pretend the user.name now is optional. So see how you can make something optional? Real quick, just add a question mark to the end of it. So now if I do user.name, and you can see when I type in name, it shows that it's optional right here. And then if the username is nil, then I can provide something like not given. So you can see how if you're providing a list of usernames in your app, showing not given when it's nil is a good default value to have versus maybe passing in zero for a default age might not work out so well. So again, no coalescing, a simple default value works best. Okay, now let's talk about force unwrapping, which can be a controversial topic. Let me show it to you and then talk about it for a second. So I can say let age equal user dot age. And you can see that is optional. And I can just say, bang, exclamation point. What this means is, uh, let me comment that out to 
not be confusing here. What this means is basically it's, it's forcing the unwrap. Even if it's nil, act like it has a value. And this will lead to crashes. So let me do print age and let me make age nil up here. So age is nil. And I basically said, let age equals user.age. If it has a value, hey, smooth sail and it'll work. If it is nil, your app's gonna crash. So let's run this and you should see the crash. And if you've been coding, you've probably seen this a ton, fatal error unexpectedly found nil while unwrapping an optional value. That means you're force unwrapping somewhere and it's biting you in the ass. You don't want to do that. Now, many developers will say never, ever, ever force unwrap. And to be honest with you, if you're a beginner just learning, that is probably the safest way to go. Never force unwrap. However, as you get more experienced, it does become a little more nuanced. And I believe 95% of the time, never force unwrap. But there are certain situations, which I'll show you in my code base, where it's fine to force unwrap, at least in my opinion. But again, there are many people that will say to never force unwrap. So you'll hear that a lot. Okay, let's comment this out so we can stop the crashes. And let's talk about optional chaining to finish this off. So this is when the entire object is optional. So let's say my name and the age are not optional, but the user itself is optional. So let's dive into that here. So we'll say var optional user. Uh, is of type user, but I put the question mark after that. So the whole user is optional. Maybe the user of our app doesn't even have to create a profile with a name or an age. So if I wanna say let name equal optional user dot name, you see it fills in the question mark right here. So that means the whole user itself is optional and not the name. So what will happen is if optional user is nil, the name will be nil. This automatically makes this property here on line 53 called name and optional. So this is called optional chaining because you're really after the name, but the whole object is an optional. And then of course you can unwrap this in the typical ways, right? We can do some nil coalescing, you know, not given, that'll work. So name will be not given if optional user is nil, you know, or you can say if let new name equal optional user dot name, say print new name. So this just shows you what chaining is. Again, once you understand the chain, you can unwrap it however you want using no coalescing, force unwrapping, guard let, all the stuff that we've just did. But just so you know, if the object itself is optional, then to get to the properties on them, you're going to see optional chaining. Now let me show you examples of these in a real code base to give you a little more context. So here's an example of if let where I'm checking the cache. So on this screen, the avatar, the channel name, and the number of subscribers up top here I am caching that information because what was happening every time I went to the screen, it was fetching the data and the UI would flash like as the new data fetched. So I didn't want that. So I wanted to show the older cached information because the avatar and the channel name don't really change and the subscriber number might change every once in a while. So basically what I do is I cache the old information and then show the new one once the network call has completed to get the new channel info. So that is a great thing for if let, because if I look in my cache and the cache is nil, then I just move on and run all the network calls and all that stuff. If I have an item in the cache, then I set my channel info to that cache channel info and update the UI that you see here. And the reason this is good for if let, and I'm not using a guard, is because I don't really care if it's nil or not, right? Whether it's nil or not, I still wanna execute the rest of the code. Whereas if I used a guard, I would have to have an early exit. I would have to return out of the function and I don't wanna return out of the function. So you wanna use guard when having something be nil makes the rest of the function irrelevant. Here's an example of using guardlet on this screen where I can drag and drop calendar items around. And when I drop them, I wanna make sure the day has enough room for it because I limit the number of events in a day. And the date on those objects is optional. So you can see if the date is nil, then I don't even wanna do all this other code. So that's a great use for the guardlet. You can see guardlet date equals date. And again, I just haven't updated my old code. In Swift 5.7, I don't need this boilerplate. I can just do guard let date. But basically, there is no date, just return false, end the function, don't even run that stuff. So again, that's a great use of guard when you want that early exit. Here's an example of no coalescing. Again, in this UI, back to that channel header with the avatar, channel name, and subscribers. Like if the channel info is nil, it's another example of chaining, then I wanna provide a default value of just NA for the channel name. You can see I use it down here as well. If channel info dot abbreviated subs, that's the subscriber count in the upper right hand corner. If that is nil, or I'm sorry, if channel info is nil, right? Because I, I get channel info from a network call. So it's nil until I get actual proper data, then I wanna show an NA if that comes back wrong for any reason. And then finally, an example of force unwrapping. Like I said, 95% of the time you should not do it, but here's an example of where I think it's okay. And to be clear, there will be developers that disagree with me and, and that is fine. But 
Here, this is date math. So this is all Apple system stuff, right? You're getting the year component for today's date and then you're calling dot start. Here I am force unwrapping this date interval. So this is all Apple system stuff. None of this is my code. None of this is anything calculation wise. This is all straight up Apple's stuff. I'm sure there may be some crazy, crazy edge case where you know this could be no, but here's the pros and cons of force unwrapping. If you do unwrap your optionals, as you saw in the previous code, you add the if let, the guard let, the no coalescing, you start to get a lot of extra code. And you can see here, I'm doing a ton of date math in this app, which is mostly using all of Apple's built-in system stuff. So I would be force unwrapping it everywhere or make my code hard to read. I'm not saying that's a reason to force unwrap. What I'm saying is this to me is one of the examples of a nuanced reason when force unwrapping is okay. This video is meant to be your very first step into unit testing. So we're going to talk about what even is unit testing and why is it important? I'm going to show you a real example in code and then we'll talk about should you even bother writing these unit tests? A unit test is where we test a small piece of code to ensure it gives us the expected outcome. Think of a basic function that takes in two numbers and adds them together. And in my head, I like to think of functions like little factories. Right, in this case, it takes in two inputs, right, two numbers, and then it does something to them, it's adding them together, and then it spits out a result. In this case, it'll spit out the sum of the numbers. So what a unit test does is it makes sure that that factory is working as expected and it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Because let's say six months down the road, a new developer comes into this code base and maybe they change the plus sign to a minus sign. Well, when we write a unit test, we're testing to make sure that that function is adding numbers together. So if a developer comes in and changes that, our unit test will catch that because that test will fail. And we'll dive into a more detailed example later in the video, but that's an introduction to what a unit test is and what it does. And I wanna stress the word unit because that's the whole point. Ideally, you wanna test the smallest piece of code possible. Now the example I just showed you, adding two numbers together, you can't get much simpler than that. But you can imagine if you had a function that was 40, 50 lines of code long, which you shouldn't really have anyway, but the idea is if you have a really long involved function, that is going to be a nightmare to test. So if you want to write good testable code, you want to break it down into the smallest chunks possible, which you should probably be doing anyway. So why is unit testing important and what are the benefits? Well, first and foremost, it can prevent errors or regressions. What's a regression, you ask? Well, I think we've all been there. You ever had a piece of code that was working and then later on you came in, maybe you tried to add a little functionality to it or you did a little refactoring or maybe you deleted a line of code you thought wasn't doing anything and then bam, everything breaks. Well, that's called a regression because things were working, now they're not working, so you went backwards. And a lot of times regressions are, are sneaky, right? You can change something in one area of the code but then it breaks something in another area because everything's interconnected. And that's why having great unit tests written, right, when you're testing that the factory is doing what it's supposed to be doing, you can catch those regressions when you run the tests and fix them right then and there. So as you can see, having good unit tests gives the developer a, a level of confidence, right, a level of safety that you can maneuver in the code base, change things, refactor things, and you know your tests are gonna catch any errors you may introduce. So this allows a developer or developer team to work a lot faster due to that safety and confidence. And this is really, really important when you're working on a large team of developers. Now this is a good time to point out that your tests are only as good as you make them. What I mean by that is if you don't think of all the edge cases or all the ways that your code can break and write a test to cover that, well then your tests aren't really gonna save you. And learning how to recognize these edge cases and write tests for them does just come with time, experience, and practice, right? You're not gonna finish watching this video and be a testing expert. It's gonna come with time. Okay, let's dive into a code example. Here I am in Xcode with a basic tip calculator app. For example, the user types in, you know, 500, they can drag the slider to see the tip and then what the bill total would be. So I'm not gonna go over all the SwiftUI code because we're really focused on this tip calculation code, because that's what we're going to test. But if you do want to follow along, I'll scroll back up to the top, pause the video, there's the code, scroll down a little bit, pause the video, there's the rest of the code. But again, we're focused on testing, so down here into our calculation struct, which by the way, I just put in the same file just for ease of use on the video. A lot of times you'll see your models or anything like this in a separate file. Let's walk through what's going on with this function. You can see I'm calculating the tip, I'm taking in the entered amount, which is a double, and then the tip, which is a double. So where am I getting the entered amount and the tip? So the entered amount here on the, on the slider, the on change, is this text field, 
Now the entered amount here is a string because it is in a text field. So I do have to convert that to a double. So essentially, you know, that will return a nil if they entered like some emojis or maybe multiple decimal places, or if they entered a string that can't be converted into a double, this will return nil. And I'm just doing, I'm just printing invalid entry. This is where you would show them an error. And then cool, once I know I have a good amount, it's a proper double, then I am calculating the tip by calling calculation.calculate tip of amount with tip slider. And then as you can guess, tip slider is coming from the slider here where I pull out, you know, zero to 100. You can tip 0% or 100%. And then I pass in the tip slider amount there. And then I calculate the tip and the total amount. So this is the small piece of code, the unit that we want to write tests for. So the first thing we need to do is add a test target to our project. Now, if you're creating a brand new project from scratch, you'll see this pop up, check that little box and you'll get what we're about to do, you know, for free out of the box. But if you have an existing project that you haven't written tests for, we need to add a testing target and that's what we're gonna do. So I'll go to file, new target. Here you can type in test. You can see there's UI test or unit testing bundle. Which the unit testing bundle? UI test is a completely separate topic. Now you can see you'll get tip calculator test. That's fine for now. All this should be good. Hit finish. And there you go. Now you have new tip calculator tests over here. And this gives you basically boilerplate of how tests work, right? You get set up, tear down, test example. We're gonna dive into this later, but what I wanna point out is if you just kept it default tip calculator test, tip calculator is the name of the app, by the way, that's like a test for your whole app. And as you can imagine, a big app, that file is gonna get a little unruly. So what you want to probably do is, and this gets into project organization, which is subjective, but this is just my recommendation, is create new files for every section of your app. Now, of course, our app is only a tip calculator, but you can imagine if you had 10 screens and you know a bunch of different functionality, you'd want a, a different file for each little section of functionality just to keep things organized. So I'm going to do that. Right click, new file, say unit test case class, hit next. We're going to call this calculation tests because my struct is called calculations. I'll show you that in a second. So hit next. Yep. Make sure your target is on the tip calculator test target, uh, not just the app target. Hit create. Cool. So you see, I basically got the same thing. The only thing that changed was uh, the name. But again, I wanted to point that out because, you know, you're probably gonna have a lot of these files testing different areas of your code. So the reason I call this calculation test is back to my content view is because I have this struct called calculation. Now, this simple example only has one function, but you can imagine if I had something called calculation, maybe I have 10 functions that are calculating a bunch of different stuff. So that is why I named it that. Now we're gonna delete all this because we're gonna write our own here. Now back to the content view, I'm actually gonna pull it up side by side. We're gonna get rid of the preview so I can see the code here. Cool, so I got my calculation code here and then my tests over here. So the first thing I like to do is test what we call, again, the happy path. Like if this code works properly, what should I expect? So when you write a test, you wanna call it func and then test it always needs to start with test and then whatever you're testing. So I'll say successful tip calculation. The basic structure of a test is you want to basically set up your variables, do something, and then assert what the result should be. So oftentimes you'll see given, when, then. Uh, you'll also see this called arrange, act, assert. I kind of like the arrange act assert better. You'll see why uh, once we do this. So the first thing we need to do is arrange our data essentially. So for calculate tip, we want to give an entered amount and a tip amount. And here's where we're setting up the scenario that we want to test. And because we're testing, you know, the, the happy path, what's supposed to happen, we're not going to give it anything crazy. So we'll say let entered amount equal 100.00. Hundred dollars, and then we'll say let tip slider equal 25.0. And I'm adding 0, .0 so it can be a double and it doesn't assume it's an int. So like I said, we're setting up our parameters, setting up the scenario that we want to test. So that's us arranging, or those are the givens. So now we act, or when, you know, when this happens, or we act. So now we want to say let tip equal calculation. Okay, so I don't have access to this calculation struct. And this is something you're probably gonna have to do most of the time. So you can do at testable and then import your app name. So tip calculator. What this does is this gives your testing file here access to all the objects in your app. So now I will have access to this calculation struct. So we're actually gonna create that up here. We'll say let calculation 
equal, we'll initialize a brand new calculation struct. So let tip equal calculation dot calculate tip of entered amount with tip slider. And I'm gonna put this onto two lines so we can make that neater. Okay, so I am calculating the tip. It's basically running this function with these parameters being passed in. So that is the act, that is what is happening. So now I wanna assert, I basically wanna give it the answer. So we use XC assert, and you can see there's a bunch of these here. Assert nil, true, false, equal, not nil. So whatever testing situation you're in, whatever you wanna test, use the proper assert. Most of the time you're gonna be using these top ones, right? True, false, equal, maybe nil. You'll see us use nil in a second. So we're gonna use equal. So we wanna make sure our tip, which is what we calculated here on line 20, equals 25. And that is because you wanna make sure a 25% tip on 100 equals 25. So you are manually giving it the answer because you wanna to test to make sure that this, this factory, this function is doing the, the proper thing. So now if I click this little diamond, I can run this test. And you can see test succeeded, get the green check marks because it is working as expected. Now you may be thinking, well, if I'm giving it the parameters and giving it the answer, like what's it testing? Because let's say on this entered amount plus or times tip percentage, uh, let's say we you know, just did a minus instead of a, a multiple sign. You know, Another developer came in there, changed it maybe by mistake or maybe thought they were doing something. Well, now when I run my test, because I've set up these parameters that, hey, this should equal 25. Well, now it's gonna fail because you know 99.75 is not equal to the 25 as expected. So you can see how now, if someone goes in and changes the code later, the factory still has to do what it's supposed to do. And that's what the test is checking for. So let's change this back to uh, the multiple sign, right? Entered amount times tip percentage. And then let's run our test again to make sure they're working green. Cool, good to go, test succeeded. So that is the happy path, that is as expected. But again, your tests are only as good as you make them. You wanna cover the edge cases and the various ways this can fail. So the next thing I wanna test is I close out my system editor, go back to my content view to get my preview up just to show you this. Well, we're relying on the user to enter a bill amount. So sure, when they enter, hey, my bill was hundred bucks, things will work. But we wanna cover you know, when the user does something silly, right? What if the user says, my bill was negative $4,500? Well, a bill is not gonna be negative, so you don't wanna calculate a tip on a negative. So we wanna account for the case where they enter a negative. And if you look at our calculation, we are uh, accounting for this, right? Guard entered amount greater than zero. So if I go back to my test here, so now I'm gonna copy and paste this test down here, and we're gonna call this, instead of test successful tip calculation, we're gonna call this test negative entered amount tip calculation. And it's fine if your test names are really long and descriptive. So entered amount, let's test negative 100. So if we look at our code, what should happen when we pass in a negative? Well, you can see, guard entered amount, uh, make sure it's greater than zero. If not, we're returning nil. And real quick, the reason I'm returning nil is because that's where I'm gonna show the error. I'll move this over real quick so we can see. If tip comes back nil, we're just printing bill amount or tip cannot be negative. That's where we would maybe show like an error to the user. Again, just a contrived example for educational purposes, but that is why I'm returning nil. So I also wanted to show you how to assert nil and test this. So now we're testing the negative amount entered. So what should happen when we calculate the tip with negative 100, again, entered amount will be less than zero, so we're returning nil. So down here in our assert, this is the only thing that changes really, is instead of assert equal, let's do XC assert nil. And what is nil? Tip should be nil. That's what this calculate tip returns. So we're saying, hey, when we get a negative amount, it should be nil. So if we run our test, this should pass, again, because our code hasn't changed. We're writing the test to make sure if it does change, we'll catch it. So for example, let's say, some developer comes in here and I don't know, they, they decide to take out this guard statement on line 78, I'll just comment it out. Well, the code will still work, right? Because if a user just only enters positive numbers, we'll never even see this bug. We'll only see this bug if the user enters a negative number. So now when we run our test, and by the way, you can do command U to run all of your tests, or you can just hit the little triangle there. But you see this one failed because this line of code is gone. Someone thought it wasn't useful, but now we caught it with our tests. And I'm gonna stop here with the code examples, but you know, we could test a negative tip amount it would be very similar to that. And again, you wanna think of all the edge cases, all the way this function can break and then write a test case for it. That way, if someone ever does come in and change the code, like you just saw, the test will catch it and you'll know right away. Okay, let me put this line of code back, do a command U to make sure my tests are all passing. Cool, tests are passed, we're good to go.
Now you may be thinking like, okay, we did all this code, all these checks for a, a very simple, small chunk of code. And I only did two examples. There's more to be had here. You might be thinking like, man, in a, in a real app with tons of code, I'm going to be writing tons of tests. That's a lot of time, effort, and work. Like, is that worth it? Okay, there's no doubt that writing good tests takes a lot of work, time, and effort. There's also no doubt that there's a lot of benefit from that work and effort. So the magic question to ask yourself, is all that work and effort worth it? And as always in programming, it depends. There's no concrete right answer for everyone. Because here's the deal, like here's what I want you to think about. Whether you're an indie developer, a small startup, or a huge company, one of the most, if not the most, valuable resources you have is your developer time and effort, like where you focus your developers. That is so valuable to a technology company. So as you can imagine, if you're a small startup, and maybe you have one developer, two developers, and you're still trying to figure out the product, right? You're still iterating, it's changing a lot. Maybe you don't have a lot of users. Well, it makes sense that the best use of that developer's time is to focus on the product, build something users actually want to get users. If that developer is spending half their time writing unit tests for features that are gonna change in a month, well, you can imagine that startup and that product is probably not gonna move fast enough to succeed. Now, of course, that's an extreme example, but let's go to the other extreme. Say you're YouTube and you have a billion users and you have a team of 100 developers. Well, now, Unit tests are a very important part of your workflow and absolutely critical to allowing that team to effectively work on that insanely large code base and make sure things don't break for your billions of users. So those are the two opposite ends of the spectrum on like, should you write unit tests? So where you fall on that spectrum, you know, depends on, again, how many users you have, how large your team is, what's the maturity of your product? You know, is it constantly changing still? Cause you're still trying to figure it out. So that's why the answer to, should you write unit tests for your project is it depends. And hopefully that example of those two extremes will help you navigate that a little bit. And it's not all or nothing either, right? It's not like either I write zero unit tests or I go for hundred percent code coverage, which you probably shouldn't do anyway, right? Even if you are that indie dev or small startup, if you have a critical piece of code, something you know is not gonna change, yeah, go and write unit tests just for that little bit. Again, you can write unit tests for whatever chunk of code you want. So. That's why the answer of should you write tests, how much should you write, it's different for every app, project, team, etc. Never use a singleton. You hear that a lot, but are they always bad? And singletons come up a lot in iOS developer interviews, so today you'll learn what is a singleton, the pros and cons of a singleton, and when and where to use them. What is a singleton? A singleton is an instance of a class that can only be created once and is globally accessible throughout your code base. Let's take a look at an example of a singleton that Apple itself uses, user defaults. User defaults is how we persist data onto the device. For example, if I wanted to show this onboarding screen only the first time my app is ever used, I would store Boolean like is first use into user defaults so that the screen only shows once. Here's the key question to ask yourself before creating a singleton. Is it vital that there is only a single instance of this class? If a second instance were to be created, would that mess things up? And user defaults is a great example of this because we want that persisted data to be consistent. Imagine if every time we wanted to fetch from user defaults or write new data to user defaults, we created a new instance of it. So now this example of is first use well, in some user defaults, it would be true. Sometimes it would be false, right? You can see how it would be very inconsistent. So you see why it's vital for there to only be one user default. So anything we store in there is going to be the same when we go to fetch it. By the way, that dot standard after user defaults is the shared instance of user defaults, which makes it a singleton. I'll tell you about that later in the video when I break down the anatomy of a singleton. Now for the pros and cons of a singleton. The first pro is that there can only be one. It's unique. So if uniqueness is what you need, like we did in that user defaults example, there you go, singletons are good for that. The second pro is also a con, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's convenient. Remember, your code base has global access to that singleton. So in the example of user defaults, no matter where I am in my app, no matter what file, I can call user defaults.standard and either fetch or write new data to it, doesn't matter where I am. But I wanna be clear, if the only reason you chose a singleton is because it's convenient, you're doing it wrong, that is not the way to go. The main reason you choose a singleton is because you need that uniqueness. You need there to only be one instance of this class. Creating a second one would mess things up. The convenience is just a bonus. 
Now for the cons of a singleton, and we'll start off with that global accessibility, that convenience that I just talked about. Because you can imagine, if you have a big code base, you see all these files, and all of these files can access that shared resource, you know, that singleton, well, you can imagine, you know, this file might be updating the singleton, which could cause a bug in another file. So you can see how it can quickly turn into this spider web if, you know, hundreds of files can all access and make changes to this singleton. It can lead to some very tricky bugs, so you got to be careful with that. And because all those files are accessing the singleton directly from their file, that makes testing pretty tricky because, you know, the, the functions in that file may rely on data from the singleton, but it's coming from an external source. It's not all self-contained in that function. So testing gets tricky. Along those lines, the whole separation of concerns that's good for programming, that gets real muddy because, again, all these files down here are accessing the same resource. However, a common way to fix this issue is to use dependency injection to inject your singleton into these files rather than accessing the singleton directly from the files. Uh, dependency injection is a topic for another video. That's coming soon. How do you create a singleton? How do you guarantee that only one of them can be created? Well, here I have a simple example, and I kept it simple because really there's only two steps. The first step in the class of my singleton is the static let shared equals my singleton. So here I'm creating a property called shared and I'm initializing an instance of my singleton, the class. Now, the second line is what guarantees the uniqueness, this private init. So the initializer is private. I can't initialize an instance of my singleton from outside of this class. So if I can only initialize the class my singleton from within the class, that's exactly what the static let shared equals my singleton is doing. I'm initializing that instance. And then now, anytime I want to use my singleton, for example, you see the function down there, do something that's on my singleton, I call my singleton dot shared do something. So how you use your singleton is that dot shared. And that's exactly what we were doing in user defaults when we did user defaults dot standard or you may see file manager, file manager .default, or URL session, URL session .shared. To be clear, that .shared, .default, .standard, that's just the name. Typically you see .shared in singletons, but they're all doing the same thing. They just chose to name it default and standard or shared. It's the same thing. So are singletons the worst design pattern in iOS? No. Singletons are a tool just like a hammer. A hammer can be used wonderfully to make beautiful things. A hammer can also be used to do some pretty bad things. Singletons have a bad reputation because they are easily abused and a lot of developers abuse them. So use them sparingly, don't overuse them, and you'll be all right. Dependency injection is when you give an object what it needs rather than that object creating or finding it itself. And it can be intimidating because the name is all fancy and there's a few different variations on it, right? Initializer injection, property injection, method injection. Should you use protocols or even property wrappers? There's a lot going on. This video teaches you the core concept on how to use it and what the benefits are. For our example, we're gonna use initializer injection, which you may also hear constructor injection, because why not, right? Dependency injection is not intimidating enough as it is. Let's call the different variations multiple names too. Like, I don't know. Anyway, initializer injection. Let's use the Chipotle app to demonstrate that. Here's our parent view, right? The list of things you can get, you know, burritos, bowls, quesadillas. When you tap on an item like a burrito, it goes to the child view, which shows a list of ingredients for that burrito. So what our child view needs is access to our, our network manager, which has our API calls, because it needs to pull down that list of ingredients, and it needs access to our bag, which is our order. So when we're adding these ingredients, we can add it to our order. So with dependency injection, instead of the child view, which is the ingredients list, creating its own network manager, creating its own bag object, we have our parent view give the child view the dependencies, right? The network manager in the bag object. And we do that through the initializer. Let's take a look at that in code. Here we have a very basic version of a network manager. You can imagine this is what holds, you know, all your API calls. Again, super simple version for the example, just the function that says fetch ingredients. Here's our bag, right? This has an array of items because we're building that order. And then we have a function called place order. Again, in real life, these two dependencies or objects, the network manager or the bag, uh, will be much more involved, much more complex, but again, keeping it simple for the example. This is what it looks like when our burrito ingredients view model here. Again, this is the child view, the list of ingredients for the burrito. It is creating its own network manager. It's creating its own bag. So this is without dependency injection. And then you can see it uses the network manager to fetch the ingredients and then it uses the bag to place order. With dependency injection, we don't want to create these 
within the child view. We want the parent view to pass them in. And like I said, we're gonna do that through the initializer. So instead of these properties creating new objects itself, we're gonna make them of type network manager, get rid of the equal sign, put a colon, get rid of the parentheses for the initializer, put a colon there. So now we just have properties called network manager that are of type network manager and bag that is of type bag. And now we're gonna build an initializer to accept values for those objects passed in. So we'll do init, and you can see uh, we get the autocomplete here. Network manager takes in a type of network manager and a bag takes in a type bag. And then you see self.networkManager equals the network manager in the bag that we passed in. So now anytime we create a burrito ingredients view model, part of the initializer, it's gonna require, hey, give me a network manager, give me a bag. That is us injecting the dependencies, dependency injection. And then you can see we're still using it, network manager fetch ingredients and then bag place order. Now here's again a quick pseudocode example. I'll paste it in here. Here's the meal category view. As you can see, this will be the parent view that has the burritos, the quesadillas, et cetera. You can see the network manager and bag get created in the parent view. And then again, more kind of pseudo code here because if you're using Swift UI, maybe this would be a navigation link to present the child ingredients view, or if you're in UI kit, maybe you're you know, a destination view controller. So this is not exact code, just to be clear, because it's gonna be different in Swift UI or UI kit, they wanna confuse you. I just wanted to make it super simple so you understood that however you're navigating, to that child view, again, the list of ingredients for burrito, this is where you would create the view model for it, right? Burrito ingredients view model, and then you pass in the network manager you created and the bag you were created at the parent view. So again, this is us injecting the dependencies into the child view rather than the child view creating them itself. Now you may be noticing a potential downside of this initializer injection. Now, whether it's property injection, initializer injection, method injection, they all have their pros and cons and use cases. That's above the scope of, of this you know, core concept video, but the potential downside of this initializer injection, you can see we have two dependencies and the initializer is not that bad, but imagine if you had four, five, six, seven dependencies. Okay, now this initializer gets a little unruly. So again, there's pros and cons to each way. Now you may be looking at this child view and say, well, that's a very minor difference. And hey, we even added more code. So isn't this a little more complex? Why are we doing this? What are the benefits of dependency injection? So that's the second part of the interview question if you get asked this, right? They're gonna ask, what is it? And then why would you do it? So the first reason you might do it is to simplify the flow of data. So in this example, where the parent view, the list of meal items, right? The burritos, the quesadilla, is passing in all the information the child needs, right? That's one flow, very easy. Whereas before, where the child view, the ingredients list, it had to create its own network manager, it had to create its own bag. You can see the flow of data is getting a little more messy. And this is a super simple example. Imagine if you had a giant app with tons of views, it turns into a giant spider web. So to help ease the understanding of how data is flowing, you know, dependency injection makes it very linear. The next two benefits kind of go hand in hand. So the first, we'll talk about the separation of concerns. With dependency injection, we're removing the responsibility of the child to create its own dependencies. They still need to know how to work with those dependencies, right? They still need to know what to do with the network manager, but it's not their responsibility to create it. That simplifies and compartmentalizes things, which also makes it easier to swap out components, right? If you make a completely new networking layer, you just inject in the new networking layer, which goes hand in hand with improving tests. That's a big thing for dependency injection, because when you try to test the child view, instead of it having to create the network manager, create the bag and all that stuff, you can just inject in a mock version of the network manager and then run your test. So the ability to inject either a mock network layer or the real network layer, and your child knows how to handle it regardless, that allows you to test the child object way easier. Understanding the concept that dependency injection is giving the child object its dependencies or what it needs versus the child object creating it itself, that is the key. And then the other key to answering the interview question is to list off a few of those benefits I just told you. The delegate and protocol pattern is a one-to-one -one communication pattern in Swift. It allows one view to communicate with another view. For example, the view controller in our bottom sheet is communicating with the main view controller. It's communicating that when the iPhone button is tapped, okay, main view controller, go ahead and update your UI with all the iPhone stuff. Again, it's a one-to-one -one communication set up with delegates and protocols. Delegates and protocols can be confusing, so I do have a starter project to keep the video as focused as possible on the topic. I will review it here in 30 seconds. It's mostly UI code. You can see the screen I have set up with an image view, a UI label, and a button at the bottom. That's what you see here, product image view, name label, product button, and then most of the code on this screen, this setup UI, it's just all UI code, right? Where I'm configuring the image, 
configuring the label, configuring the button, and then setting up constraints. You can see the image there. And then the other piece of code is actually presenting the other view controller, the bottom sheet, right? So when I tap choose product, we get this bottom sheet. And that's what's happening right here in this present product selection VC. You can see we're setting up the sheet with the detents medium. That's how it goes halfway up. We're showing the grabber and the view controller I'm showing is the product selection VC. Let's go to the product selection view controller. Let's get the simulator back up. Again, just three buttons iPhone button, iPad button, MacBook Pro button, all this code here, it looks like a lot of code. I know it's just setting up the UI. I'm configuring three buttons and then setting the constraints on those three buttons. And I do have actions for those three buttons, right? When the iPhone button is tapped. Right now we're just dismissing it. Tapping on the MacBook, we're just dismissing it. That's the overview of the starter project. As you can see, I've done nothing with delegates and protocols. It's just purely UI setup. But let's start talking about those delegates and protocols. As I mentioned in the intro, we need to communicate between these two view controllers, our product selection view controller and our main view controller, right? The product selection one is the one with the buttons, the main view controller is in the back. So that is a perfect scenario for a one-to-one -one communication, which again, delegates and protocols. Let me back up and explain the, the concept of delegates because this was a light bulb moment for me to understand the concept of a delegate. Basically a delegate is, is sitting back, waiting to be told when and what to do. You don't call delegate methods themselves, they get called automatically when they're told what to do. That's the big picture context to keep in mind as we build this, it'll make a lot more sense once we you know, code it up. Okay, so if the delegate is sitting around waiting to be told when and what to do, something has to give it that order, something has to give it those instructions. And I like to use a boss in an intern analogy. So in our case, the product selection VC, this card right here, is gonna be telling the main view controller what to do. The product selection view controller, the half sheet, has all the information. It knows what was tapped. It knows the iPhone was tapped. It knows the iPad is tapped. And it has to pass that message along to the main view controller so it will update its view here. I don't have the code set up, so it's not updating, but this image will change to an iPhone or a Mac, whatever. So in our case, the product selection VC is the boss. The main view controller is the intern. The main view controller is just sitting around, hey, Tell me what to do and I'll do it, right? It's just waiting to be told. So to set that up in our product selection VC, which is gonna be the boss in this case, we need to create a protocol. So protocol, and we'll call it product selection delegate. And what a protocol is, is essentially to keep it super simple, is a list of commands. Think of it like the job description, right? If you're gonna be my intern, here are the tasks that you need to know how to do. So for us, we're gonna create a function called did select product and we're going to pass in the name of the product which is a string and also the image name so we know what image to update and by the way my image names in my assets i have these built into the project which you can download i have a link to in the description to a dropbox file to download the project but you can see i have the iphone imac it's super small but those are my assets the images are in there and you can see their names ipad iphone mac so I pull in my simulator so you can see here, we need to pass in the name of the product so we can update the label. It won't say Apple product line, it'll say iPhone or whatever. And then we need to pass the image name so it knows what image to show here. Now, in our simple example, we're only having one command, right? This is like the job description. This is what the intern needs to know how to do. You could have did action two, func did action three. And these are just kind of placeholders for other things that could potentially be done on your screen. I just want to point out that a protocol can have many commands, right? It's a list of instructions, a list of commands. Our simple example is only gonna have one, but again, I wanna make it clear, you can have more than one. Now that we have our, our job description, essentially, right? Telling the intern what you need to know how to do, we need to actually have a, a quote unquote intern on our product selection screen. So for that, we have a variable called delegate, and that is of type product selection delegate. That's what we just created up here. And that is gonna be an optional because we're gonna have to tell this view controller what the delegate is. In our case, it's gonna be the main view controller. We'll come back to that in a second. But I wanna set up our product selection view controller, which in this case is our boss. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I think repetition is the key to really learn this stuff. So like I said, job description in the protocol. Here is the actual job position, if you wanna use that analogy. So now our boss is set up. We have the job description, we have the position. Now let's go to our view controller and essentially apply for the job. So to do that, we need to conform to the product selection delegate. So in order to do that, you do comma product selection delegate up here in your class definition of the view controller. Now Xcode's gonna yell at me, do a command B. It says type view controller does not conform to protocol selection delegate. Because in order to conform to product selection delegate, we have to have these functions in place. This did select product, the, the tasks of the job. So back to view controller, Xcode will fill these stubs in. Now this may look familiar. If you've ever built a table view in UI kit, you have to implement the table view delegate methods. If you've ever done like location manager, there's a location update delegate method. 
And again, those methods are just sitting back, waiting to be told what to do, and they fire off automatically. And you'll see that, you'll notice, I'm not actually gonna call did select product in the view controller. We're gonna call it from somewhere else, and then that will fire off automatically. So I actually don't like the position of this. My variable's up top, and then my function. So we'll put it down below view did load. So now that I have signed up for the job, I need to do something when I get told what to do this job. So in our case, we're gonna set the product image view. We'll pull up the simulator again, right? The product image view is the image of Apple products, and then the product name label is where it says Apple product line. So I wanna do product name label dot text equals name, and you'll see we're gonna pass in this information. And I wanna do product image view dot image equals UI image named image name, right? We're passing in this information. You'll, we haven't done that yet. You'll see that in a second. But our intern, right? Our intern has signed up for the job. I'm conforming to the delegate. And I know what to do when I'm told, hey, do your job. Like I said, I don't call this did select product from the view controller. The view controller is a delegate. It's sitting back waiting to be told what to do. Once it gets that order, it's gonna go ahead and do this job. So that's the premise of the delegate. So there's two more steps we need to do. If I go back to my product selection VC to continue with this analogy, I have my job description, I have the job opening. Well, back in my view controller, I say, hey, I'm applying for the job and I know how to do the job, so let me get hired, so to speak. So here where I'm presenting, present product selection VC, right? I'm creating it, I'm initializing a brand new one, and then I'm doing all the modal presentation to make it a half sheet, that's what all that code is, and then I present it. Well, now that I have this destination VC, I can set the delegate here. So I can say destination VC dot delegate equals self. Now self in this case is the view controller. I am signing up for this job. Remember the destination VC is a product selection VC, so if I, VC short for view controller, if you haven't picked that up yet. So now that's this variable right here that I am setting. When I create a brand new product selection VC, I'm also initializing it with a delegate that I have set here equal to self. The view controller is saying, hi, sign me up. I wanna be your delegate. I wanna be your intern. So now that this is connected, the main view controller, right, that has our product images is ready to do the job. The final piece of the puzzle in our product selection VC, or in this case, our boss, is to actually give the order, give the command to do the job. Now, when do we want to do that? Again, pulling up the simulator, we want to do that when the iPhone button is tapped, when the iPad button is tapped, when the MacBook Pro is tapped. We're going to give the order, hey, update your UI with the iPad, update your UI with the MacBook. So to give those orders, we do that in our iPhone button tapped. Now, this is just my educational example with the buttons. This could be anything going on in this screen. Maybe it's on a countdown timer. Maybe it's when they push a button six times, like whatever triggers this, right? In our case, it's a button tap, but this can be any trigger where you call this line of code where you say, okay, delegate. Now you say did select product. And because we tapped the iPhone, right? We're in the iPhone button tapped. The product name I want to pass in is iPhone. 14, and then the image name is just iPhone. So you're telling the delegate, okay, do your job delegate, and here's the information you need to do your job. And if I go back to the view controller, this did select product is gonna get fired off, and whatever name and image name I pass in, on my main view controller, I'm going to set my product name label to that name, and the product image view to the image. Let's run this and see it in action, and then we'll set up the other two. So I'm choosing product, tap iPhone, now my delegate, the main view controller knows, hey, I'm gonna update my label to iPhone 14, and I'm gonna update my image to the iPhone. So let's go back and do the other ones. So back to product selection VC, I'm gonna copy and paste this command here. So copy that, put it in the iPad button tap, put it in the MacBook button tap. So instead of iPhone 14, we're gonna say iPad Air, and then that image is just iPad. And then instead of iPhone 14 for the MacBook, we're gonna say MacBook, and then the image is Mac. So now when I run it, no matter what button I tap, it should update accordingly. So choose product, hit the iPad, bam, there's the iPad Air, choose product, hit the MacBook Pro, there's the MacBook. I guess I could have called that MacBook Pro on the label. That's neither here nor there. But now you can see there's two views communicating in a one-to-one -one pattern. In today's video, we're talking about the UI view controller lifecycle methods. You know, view did load, view will appear, view did disappear, all that stuff. I'm going to talk about when each one is called, you know, what you should be doing in each one. And I'm also gonna share a common example of the difference between view to load and view will appear because that's a very common situation new developers get themselves into. And we're also gonna dabble into the whole view will layout subviews and view did layout subviews. Before we dive into the details of each one, let's talk about when these methods are called because I think that's a source of confusion for people just starting out, right? You may see a method and then you're expecting a very explicit method call to actually call that method. Well, these ones get called automatically by the system. So you're not gonna see, you know, view to load get explicitly called. Now, when they're called, that's what we're gonna dive into with the specifics of each one, but just know they're called automatically.
Now, when you create your own view controllers, you're subclassing a UI view controller. And when you subclass the UI view controller, you're inheriting all these view lifecycle methods. So when you're using view did load in your view controller, that's why you're calling super dot view did load because you want to get all the magic that Apple built on the view controller. And then the code you enter in view did load is your own custom code for this specific subclass of view controller. Now I just use view did load as the example, but that applies for all these lifecycle methods. So if you're wondering why you're calling super in these, that's why. First up, view did load. Now view did load gets called when the view controller's content view gets created in memory or loaded from the storyboard. What's the content view? Let's pull up a storyboard to show you this real quick. So here on the left, we have a view hierarchy of a view controller. If you've ever noticed when you create a view controller on storyboard, you get this view right here by default. This is the view controller's content view. So when that view first gets created in memory, view did load gets called. This has nothing to do with what's displaying on the screen. This is when it gets created in memory or loaded from the storyboard. Now, because it's loaded from the storyboard, if I go to a screen here, that is why all your outlets will have a guaranteed value in view did load, right? That's why your outlets can be uh, implicitly unwrapped optionals. You may have wondered like, why am I force unwrapping these outlets? Well, again, in view did load, your outlets are guaranteed to have a value. That's why we can do this. Now let's move on to view will appear and then we'll do the example and the difference between view to load and view will appear. Now view will appear gets called just before the content view is added to the actual app's view hierarchy. So just before it actually shows up on the screen. So let me talk about the word appear real quick because being added to the app's view hierarchy means it's in the view hierarchy. However, it may not appear on your screen and that could be for a reason. Maybe your view is, you know, my view dot hidden, but it's still in the view hierarchy or maybe there's another view on top of that view. So just because it's not actually showing up on the screen, view will appear still happens because it's actually in the view hierarchy. So wanted to clear up that confusion, you know, view will appear doesn't necessarily mean it's actually showing on the screen. Again, because you could have dot is hidden or a view could be on top of it, but it's still there. Now let's get into a very common example on when to use view to load and view will appear, right? This happens all the time in apps. So let me pull up the simulator here. So here in this app here, so this search VC, View to load is called, bam, this is there. Now let me go to the next screen. Uh, this is the GitHub followers course, by the way. So now uh, this is the search VC. This is the follower list VC, right? Now, when I go back, right, view did load is not gonna get called, but view will appear gets called because on a navigation controller, you're just putting a new view controller onto the stack. But this search VC is still there. So therefore, view did load only gets called that first time. But every time I come back to the screen, view will appear gets called. Now here's how we're using this in this app, right? So here on the search VC, we're using it to uh, reset the username text field to blank. So every time we come back to the screen, we want that text field to be blank. If we didn't have this line of code, that S-A-L-L-E-N-0400 would always still be there. But now let's move setting the navigation controller uh, to false into view did load up here. So this will prove that view did load only gets called once, right? Because the very first time we run it, we're going to set that navigation bar hidden equal to true, right? Okay, look, no nav bar. And then we go to the next screen, hit get followers. Now there's a nav bar, right? We're showing the nav bar on this screen. But when we go back to the, the search VC, we don't want to show the nav bar. It's just a styling choice. But when we go back, because view did load only got called that first time, now we have a nav bar here with this search thing, right? Because this navigate, set navigation bar hidden to true is not getting called. So that's why we call this in view will appear, right? So remember that view did load only gets called that once. However, view will appear is gonna get called every time the view comes on screen. So now that we have that back in view will appear, every time the view comes on the screen, we're making sure we hide that navigation bar. So uh, this is just one common example of using, you know, view will appear over view did load. A lot of beginning developers get caught up on that. They're not sure why the behavior is happening and they don't understand that view did load only gets called that first time. And then if you want to change stuff every time a screen, you know, shows up, you got to do it in view will appear. All right, let's move on to view did appear. So, right, we just did view will appear. So that happens before the view appears, so you can change it. And then now you have view did appear. So this is what gets called after the view is in the apps view hierarchy and could potentially be showing up on your screen. So you wanna do stuff here like maybe animations, right? Because if you start an animation in view did load or view will appear, it may start a little bit too soon, right? You want a visual animation to start 
once the screen you know is showing up now moving on to view will disappear right so this is very similar to view will appear except instead of getting called before the view is added to the apps view hierarchy this gets called just before it's removed from the apps view hierarchy so you'd want to do stuff in here like uh like committing save changes right uh so let's say you're you have a form on your app and before you dismiss the form you want to make sure you save everything like even if the user dismisses you know prematurely maybe you want to save it for some reason so you would do that in view will disappear because you want to make sure you do that before the view is gone and then you have view did disappear so this is something you'd want to do after the view has been removed from the views hierarchy now let's wrap this up by talking about the less common ones and that is view will layout subviews and view did layout subviews now view will layout subviews is called when your views bounds change and it's before all the subviews have been laid out very common example of the views bounds changing is when you rotate from portrait to landscape on your phone right you can see the views bounds changing kind of in real time in the animation so view will layout subviews gets called after the views bounds change but before it relays out all the subviews that are, you know are on the screen and by default like view will layout subviews and view did layout subviews like there's no default implementation they're just there to give you, the programmer, access to this point in time so you can make changes if you need to. So view will layout subviews gives you that chance, you know, again, in the example, after you rotate your device, before it lays out all the subviews on the screen, you have the chance to, to do any customization. And then view did layout subviews, again, gives you that chance after the subviews have been laid out, if you need to do anything, like maybe an animation or something like that. Now this is a huge topic that I could do hours and hours of videos on. However, we're gonna keep this video at a high level because the entire point of this video is for you to be able to answer an interview question. Now during an interview, they're asking you a lot of questions. So they're not gonna expect you to be an expert and deep dive into this topic. They're just gonna wanna know that you have a very basic general understanding of what's actually going on with concurrency and threading. And with that being said, we're gonna talk about the different thread types, the main thread, the background thread. We're gonna talk about queues a little bit, uh, serial queues, concurrent queues. And then we're also gonna talk about how Grand Central Dispatch kind of ties it all together and you can move things around from different threads and queues. All right, let's dive in. So let's start with the big picture and what is concurrency? Basically concurrency is doing multiple tasks at the same time. Now what allows us to do this is Apple's multi-core processors. Here I have pictured just an example of the latest A10 processor, which is a quad core processor uh, in the iPhone 7. So the more cores you have, the more tasks you can do at the same time. Now all these tasks are being executed on what are called threads. Imagine threads is kind of like this major highway. Each lane in the highway is a thread, in each car in that lane is a task being executed on that thread. Now you notice here pictured, I have a, a lane here on the left, the express lane, that's real clean and speedy. And that is called our main thread. And the reason we wanna keep our main thread, you know, speedy and clean is because that is what our UI is done on. So for example, if you clog up this main thread with a very, you know, time intensive task, your UI is gonna freeze and your user is gonna think your app is locked up. So that's why we do all those time heavy tasks on the background threads, keep the main thread clear so the UI is still responsive. Now all this management of the main thread and all the background threads you can have, because you can have you know, a, a lot of background threads, can get really hard and tricky. Uh, however, luckily Apple has built something for us called Grand Central Dispatch and NS Operation Queues, which is basically just an API built on top of this threading to make our lives as developers easier. And essentially it just handles all the heavy lifting of creating and managing threads for us. As developers, we just work with a queue of tasks, give that to Grand Central Dispatch, and it just handles all the thread management stuff for us. It's pretty nice. So by now you're probably asking, what's a queue? Imagine a queue like people lining up for Star Wars. And I'm, I don't know what kind of crazy people do this. Certainly not me. Definitely, definitely not me. I, I lined up for Star Wars and I loved every second of it. But anyway, it's a line. So the first person in the line is the first person to go into the movie theater. It's called first in, first out. And that's really all a queue is. Uh, you just line up tasks, and then the task that went in first is the first one to get executed. The second one is the second one to get executed. Let's take a look. So here you see all our tasks come in. Task one is the first one to go. It gets executed first. Then task two will get executed, then three, and so on, and so on. There's your basic queue. Now, there's two types of queues. We have a serial queue and a concurrent queue. We're gonna talk about the differences there. We kind of just saw the serial queue, so we'll run through it again real quick, but the serial queue, the tasks come in in order, and then task two doesn't start until task one is 100% complete. Task three doesn't start until task two is 100% complete. So everything happens one at a time in order. 
Now let's take a look at a concurrent queue. So in a concurrent queue, everything still starts in the same order. So the tasks are gonna start one, two, three, four. However, task two does not have to wait for task one to complete to start. So therefore things will happen quicker, but as you can see, it's gonna be unpredictable on how things finish. So you can see things start in order, one, two, three, four. However, certain tasks are quicker than other tasks. Let's take a look at that one more time. Now, imagine task two being something like downloading a high-res image, whereas task four is you know, just downloading some text. So task two certainly starts first. However, task four happens much quicker. So yes, concurrent stuff, you're doing stuff at the same time, so it ends quicker. However, the order of completion is very unpredictable. So this leads us into the pros and cons of each. When should you use a serial queue? When should you use a concurrent queue? Uh, let's talk about the serial queue first. So in a serial queue, it's a predictable execution order. So everything happens in order, one, two, three, four. Two doesn't even start until one is done. So this prevents race conditions, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, it's very predictable. Let's take a look. So again, the tasks come in, task one gets completed, task two gets completed, task three, task four, etc. Everything's in order, one at a time, pretty clean. However, as you can imagine, this is slower because everything is happening one at a time. Task two doesn't even start until task one is complete. So concurrent queues are faster because yes, they still start in order, but everything is kind of happening concurrently or at the same time. However, this results in an unpredictable order in what uh, I mentioned earlier in race conditions. So we're gonna look at our example again here in a second, but I want you to imagine something first. Imagine task three and task four are related and your code has some conditional logic that is relying on task three to be complete before task four. However, you put it on a concurrent queue, so you can't guarantee the order of completion. Now, sometimes task three will be done before task four. You can't really predict that. It all depends on how the system is managing the threads and the resources. And again, that's why it's called a race condition because you can never be certain which task is gonna finish before the other task. Uh, and again, that's why it has an unpredictable order. Again, remember the concurrent queue is a much faster way to execute a group of tasks. However, you just have to not care about the order they get executed in. So for example, let's say you're saving a bunch of user preferences. You don't care what order they get saved in. You just want it to be saved as quick as possible. So that's when you would use a concurrent queue. And vice versa, when the order of execution is absolutely imperative, then you would want to use a serial queue. Now by default, every app gets one serial queue, which is the main queue, and then four concurrent queues, which are your background queues of various priorities. Now you can create your own custom queues, uh, but for the most part, this main queue that you get and the four uh, concurrent queues in the background, that's usually more than enough for what you need. Um, if you want to create your own custom ones, that's probably more a little more advanced, uh, but just know that you can do that. So how do we switch back and forth between these queues? Now, you've probably seen this little bit of code before, this ditchbashq.main.async, and then you do some code in there. A very common case when you would use this is what I have shown. Now, let's say you downloaded uh, some JSON data from the internet, you're populating a table view. Once all that stuff is done downloading, you wanna reload your table view to show your data. Well, all that downloading stuff is happening on a background thread. Now you wanna shift to a main thread to update your UI. Remember, the main thread is kinda like the UI thread. So here what this code is doing, uh, it is dispatching off the background thread to the main thread, and then here we are reloading our table view data. This is a very common little chunk of code, and uh, updating your UI on the main thread is something you'll do all the time as a developer. So you'll see this a lot. Now you can move stuff to a background queue manually uh, here using dispatch queue.global and the QoS stands for quality of service. And in this case, we want it to be on a background. Um, and then you just run whatever code you run run in this block. Now, to be honest with you, I have almost never used this code to manually send something to a background queue. I'm not saying you're never gonna use it, but the previous example of moving something to the main queue in the main thread is much more common uh, than manually sending something to the background thread. But I did just wanna show you this so you know it is possible. But again, far and away, the most common way you're gonna use Grand Central Dispatch is moving stuff from a background queue to the main queue using this dispatch queue.main.async uh, and then doing something like reloading your table view. First, I'm gonna start off with a brief description of what automatic reference counting is, and then we're gonna dive into some code to go over some examples. All right, automatic reference counting. Now, this is Apple's way of handling memory management of objects for you. Now, what it's doing is for each object, it's keeping account of how many strong references are pointing to that object. For example, let's say I have a person class, Sean. There's also a camera class, a phone class, and a MacBook class. Now these classes can all have a strong reference pointing back to Sean. So automatic reference counting is gonna say that the count is four. So if I, even if I made Sean equal to nil to try to get rid of Sean from memory, automatic reference counting won't allow it. it. Sean will not be released from memory because there's three other objects pointing back to it. How do we fix that? We need to make those strong references a weak reference. So let's dive into some code and take a look at a real life example. 
Okay, let's do this. Uh, first, let me walk you through the basic setup. If you remember in the introduction, I talked about a person class, a camera class, a phone class, and a MacBook class. In order to simplify this coding example, we're just gonna deal with two of the classes, the person and the MacBook, but it will still illustrate the point perfectly. So let me walk you through this person class, let you know what's going on here. Uh, a person gets initialized with a name and a MacBook. The MacBook is optional. You may not have a MacBook, maybe you like Windows, I don't know. And on lines 13 through 15, we have our dinit call. Now this only gets called when the object is actually released from memory. So this is gonna let us know when our object is clear from memory and we don't have a retain cycle, or if it doesn't get called, we do have a retain cycle. So you'll see this in action here in a little bit. And then the MacBook class is very similar. Uh, the MacBook has a name. Uh, the MacBook has an owner, which is a person object uh, up here, this class up here. On 24 through 27, it gets initialized with a name and an owner, which is the person object. And again, that's optional as well, just like the MacBook here for the person. And then same thing, the dinit, this gets called when the MacBook is released from memory. Okay, let's dive into some code. So the first thing we need to do on the left here is create our variables. So let's go ahead and create Sean. And Sean is of type person, and it's optional. And then var, uh, we're gonna call our MacBook Matilda. I have no reason why, just what I wanna call it. And that's optional as well. <clears throat> so we have our variables created. Uh, I'm just gonna break this up into functions. This obviously isn't a real app, but I'm gonna break it into functions just to separate the information. And hopefully that makes it easier to learn. So let's go ahead and create a function called create objects. And in here, we're gonna go ahead and initialize Sean and Matilda. So Sean equals person. And see our initializer method lets us autocomplete. So the name, name is gonna be Sean. And the MacBook right now is gonna be nil. I haven't gotten to the store yet to go buy it. So I don't have a MacBook yet. Uh, let's go ahead and create Matilda. She's sitting in the store waiting for me to buy her. Uh, so she's of type MacBook. And again, the initializer method lets us go ahead and give her the name. And the owner is nil. Haven't bought her yet. So there you go. So here's what we've created now. So just by creating these objects, as you can see in the image here, we have one strong reference. Sean has a reference to itself and Matilda has a reference to herself. You notice MacBook and owner are still nil. There's no references to each other there. So all good starting out. Let's go ahead and call this here just so when I run it, uh, stuff actually happens. And just to prove that we only have one reference and we can uh, deinit each other. So let's go ahead and just set Sean equal to nil and Matilda equal to nil. Go ahead and run it. So as you can see down here in the console, our deinit methods got called for both the MacBook and the person. So Sean is being deinitialized and Matilda is being deinitialized. So everything's working fine. No retain cycles here. Okay, let's go back up to create objects and get rid of us uh, nailing out uh, Sean and Matilda. Let's create another function called uh, assign properties. And what this is gonna do is now we're gonna create the strong references that are gonna cause trouble. This is gonna cause the retain cycle. So uh, let's go ahead and fix Sean.MacBook. I went to the store, bought my MacBook, and it is Matilda. And then Matilda now has an owner, and it's me, Sean. So there you go. So as you can see in this image, now we have strong references from Sean and Matilda pointing back and forth to each other, and this is the bad thing. This is the retain cycle. So Sean has a strong reference to itself, a strong reference to Matilda, but Matilda is actually pointing back to Sean now too with a strong reference. So back here in Assign Properties, let's go ahead and make Sean equal to nil. Now, uh, let's go ahead and make sure we call assign properties here at the top. Now, if you remember what I said in the intro, because there's an outside object pointing to Sean, in this case, Matilda.owner is pointing to Sean, Sean will not be removed from memory. And the reason is, is you only get removed from memory when the automatic reference count equals zero. So even though I got rid of Sean's strong reference to itself, there's still Matilda pointing to Sean. So there's still one left. So it's not gonna be deinitialized. So let's go ahead and run it to prove that. Okay, so it's running. Uh, you're just gonna have to trust me on that. My simulator's on another screen, nothing got printed out. So there's no way for you to know, but uh, trust me, it's running and our dinit method over here in lines 13 and 14 of our person class is not getting called. And again, the reason is because there's still a strong reference pointing from Matilda to Sean. So Sean cannot be deinitialized. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, the fix for this is to make one of the variables weak. Uh, over here in our classes, uh, now this depends on how your data is structured. Uh, for this example, let's say the MacBook is the lesser important object. So we're gonna go ahead and make the MacBook the weak variable. So as you can see here on line 22, I made the owner variable, which is a person, weak. So now if you look at this updated image, you see Sean still has a strong reference to itself. It still has the strong reference to Matilda, but now there's no longer a strong reference pointing from Matilda to Sean. So now when I make Sean nil, he's able to be released from memory because Matilda's not holding on to him from the outside anymore. So let's go ahead and test that. Go ahead and run it. 
And as you can see in the console, now our dnit method for Sean is getting called and Sean is being deinitialized. So now let's double check something. Let, let's test out, uh, let's go ahead and print matilda.owner. Right, Sean's no longer memory, Matilda should no longer have an owner. Let's go ahead and run that. So as you can see in the console, again, Sean is being deinitialized. So Sean's gone, he's away from memory, and now Matilda's owner is nil. Matilda no longer has an owner because Sean is gone. So we've cleared our retain cycle. And just for good measure, we can go ahead and set Matilda equal to nil as well now. Now that the Sean strong references don't exist, go ahead and run that just to double check. So as you can see, both Sean and Matilda can now be removed from memory, whereas before, when they had their strong references pointed back to each other, neither one of their strong reference counts would have ever gotten to zero, so they could have never been deallocated from memory. If you have a lot of these throughout your code, it really affects the performance of your app.